I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, so next I'll just do a quick roll call of the board members. Uh, Dr. Costello. Here. Mr. Kilcoin. Here. Mr. Lalka. Here. Uh, Mr. Diplock. Here. And Mrs. Arrington. Here. And I'm Davis Pokolsky and I'm here. Uh, any announcements from the board or anybody else? Hearing none, uh, the board did enter into executive session at uh, 6.06 um, and we discussed one potential legal matter, one current legal matter, and uh, the employment history of one particular person. Uh, and then we exited that at 6.27. Any amendments or adjustments to the agenda? Uh, we did since the agenda was published, we did add to item 4.2, where we will talk about uh, board goals. Uh, we added the draft of Board of Education goals. Dr. Hughes used um, the goals we drafted last year and kind of marked it up a bit and made some suggestions. Uh, I figured that would be a good starting point. I do apologize. I didn't think of having them add it until today. So that's why that's last minute. And then also we have some last minute uh, resignations and appointments at 5.4 and 5.5 are resignations and also 5.6 uh, will be appointment. Just one more check, no more um, additions to the agenda. All right, so next we are going to be getting to uh, the discussion uh, and presentation of the reopening of 2020-21 schools by uh, Mrs. Mikowski and Mr. Sikorsky, the co-chairs of the district's reopening committee. All right, I'm going to throw up a part of the plan here that Jenna is going to begin with, and then we'll go through it. Uh, our plan then will be to address a number of the different questions. We've received um, a lot of similarities in them, so we're hoping to uh, get some answers to folks before we um, hear what the questions from the board will be. So let me present this. And I'll just go ahead and get started. Thanks for having us this evening. Um, I want to send um, a sincere thank you to our committee members, um, to our subcommittee chair people, um, and to our entire school community. I think the most important thing for everybody to know is that your feedback, your thoughts, your questions and concerns will help to shape our next steps. These are really difficult and uncertain times and very emotional for everybody involved. And I think it's important that everybody recognizes that and, and know that the work of the committee is twofold, to research different documents and guidance that is out there and also to hear from their stakeholders. So we had a meeting today and talked to um, full committee members about what are you hearing from your stakeholders? What are your conversations like with your friends? What are some of the things that you're hearing about that people are most concerned about? And while this, everyone's calling it a plan, I've started to call it a document because it really is not a plan. And I think it's referenced in the executive summary that there are no answers. And I think the most frustrating thing for anybody who is looking for answers is where we sit right now, not only as a school community, but regionally, statewide, um, and really nationally. Um, so I, I realize the frustration and the want for people to have answers, um, but know that the nearly 115 people who are shaping this work are watching out for our parents, our students, and our entire school community. And I don't know that we can say that enough. Um, I appreciate the work that everybody has put into this and the conversations that really have helped to guide us through this process. There is a lot more work to be done for sure. Um, and we are very aware of that. Um, and the details are going to be the hardest part yet to come, but our commitment 
to being prepared for opening on September 9th, I want you all to know that that is the most important thing to all of us. Um, and so just a note of sincere thanks to all of our committee members in our entire school community for your thoughts and your feedback um, and certainly your emails that have gone to a number of us. Um, we do appreciate it and it is a part, an important part of our work. Um, so at that, I'll turn it over to Ryan. All right. I'm sure I'm not muted here. Thanks, Jen. Um, I think that you <laughs> certainly summed that up well. We couldn't do this work without our stakeholders helping and for sure um, people come prepared, they come passionate and it's uh, really been a positive experience here as we work through this together. So um, we're gonna go through these plans, but certainly next steps, we have a survey in draft form. And Jen, if there's anything I missed, feel free to jump in. But surveying parents and, and community members just about anything from how well they feel with regards to school and opening and their comfort level with kids coming back into buildings, to transportation, to food service, to really the nuts and bolts of facilities we plan to tackle with some of the survey questions. And Jen and I are gonna meet on Thursday um, to finalize that, go through it one more time um, with the input of Dr. Hughes and his committee, the executive level, and hope to get that out to our parents and stakeholders by Friday. But we cannot stress enough the importance that your role plays in that. And we're going to ask for your family's name and your child's name. Um, and all of this is in an effort to try to get to a place where we can uh, be compassionate towards each family's needs. You know, certainly knowing that with 5,000 students in this district would be a challenge to provide a personalized plan for everybody. But we wanna hear from as many people as possible because we wanna really tailor this to community needs. And, you know, I know that there is certainly a lot of plans that have come out from different districts that are articulating what they're gonna do. Um, but that's not, that's not what Frontier is gonna do. We have very different circumstances uh, in most cases. And I think, you know, we really need to tailor a plan around our community and our community's needs. So what we're gonna present tonight are different options. Um, <clears throat> by no means are these uh, set in stone at this point. They certainly are for presentation here. They came from a lot of work of our committee members and not always agreeable work of our committee members, but nonetheless, we'll talk about how all of those voices were reflected. So the first plan is an enhanced traditional plan. And some have asked, why is this even in here? This is in here because this is what we all want. We all want our kids to be back in school together as safely as possible. And while we certainly recognize that at this point, it may be a challenge to get here, um, this is our goal. And you know, some of those challenges that lie exist with facilities and spacing and our student population and you know, our staffing numbers um, that will make it very challenging for this plan to be implemented. But it's in here because this is our goal. This is what we all wanna see. Um, you know, I, I don't think anyone on the committee is in favor of a virtual option or hybrid, you know, if it has to do without, you know, the safety component. So um, we want kids in school. We don't want that to be something that's out there. We want them there. That's why this part is here. Um, and certainly it would be with guidance from the Department of Health, guidance from the governor. We certainly would make sure that uh, all of the recommendations for cleaning and things of that nature and precautions were put into place. So it's just in there because we want kids there. We realize that it may not be the most realistic option at this point. I do um, think too, sorry Ryan, to jump no, in. Yeah. Um, I think we all understand, people who I can see on my screen, people who I can't, that we can never replace the face-to-face -face instruction and students in front of teachers live. And watching them learn, not only what they can put on paper, but what they contribute to a discussion. Uh, you can see it in their faces. You can see what they enjoy the most. So it's important for us to do our due diligence around everybody coming back. The constraints may not be possible, but we can never replace that face-to-face in-person instruction. Sorry, Ray. No, that was a great point to add. <clears throat> So looking within that, we had a consideration noted for our special classrooms uh, and those students who may require additional support beyond, you know, uh, generally developing peers. So looking at that for our special education populations 
and this was it's really in here because our committee was sort of split on this do we uh, look at a model where our students attend in those particular classes five days a week for half days um, you know receiving their therapies and phys ed and all of the different IEP accommodations that they may have or do we look to a full day program uh, where they're coming for about five hours a day every day you know obviously we would hope for an increased retention rate with that we would hope that our students are really ingrained deeply in uh, their academics but are also um, working on things such as job coaching and transitioning and different components that are important to their plan as well um, our committee was sort of split on this. We certainly realized that a half day, no matter who we're talking about and what population we're talking about, is going to put constraints on families. And so that will be one of the survey questions. Are you in favor of a half day or are you not? And so we're really looking for some honest feedback with that. And one of the things that when we put um, survey questions um, out to the 100, nearly 115 people, we what we got back is what we were hoping for. People were um, surveying and answering based on uh, the stakeholders that they represent and their own perspective. So that's the reason why this, the survey then going back out to parents will give us additional information as we craft a plan going forward. For our students who do have uh, a health issue that would impair them from or put them at a higher risk for attending school, we certainly would come up with a virtual plan for, for those children as well. Um, again, hoping that we're not missing a beat with any sort of instruction that goes on with those children. So plan two then moves into the what's probably more common around the area, I would say at this point, and that being the hybrid model. Um, we have two different considerations out here that I, are not new uh, that many have seen. Um, the first is looking at basically a split in our alphabet and having students come on a Monday and Thursday with virtual being opposite for their peers. And then students who did not come on Monday and Thursday attending Tuesday, Friday um, with remote learning for all on Wednesday. Um, you know, in looking at that model, we were asked what pros and cons are. And for me, <clears throat> um, Looking at this model here, a student would be in person on Monday. While they're there with their teachers on Monday, they're getting set up for what they're gonna need to do at home on Tuesday, um, Wednesday as well. And then when they come back Thursday, there's an opportunity to review that information, get set up for what's gonna happen Friday before they head into the weekend. We thought that we would include this plan because it limits the amount of days that students uh, don't receive direct in-person contact with their teachers. And that's the biggest pro for this one. Um, looking, I don't know, Jen, if you have anything else well, on that. Sorry. I was just going to add, just looking at that remote Wednesday piece, you know, certainly setting expectations around what that would look like when everyone is home on Wednesday. We also surveyed um, regionally um, schools, what their day out, if you will, would be um, with the majority of those days being Wednesday. Um, and again, just like Ryan said, you're just having them in front of you and then setting them um, out for Tuesday and then coming back on Thursday, but with contact on that Wednesday. Hey, Ryan and Jen, can I ask a real quick question? It's John. Sure. sure. On this plan, I just had one question, the alphabet split. What if 70% were in the A to L for a class or a grade level? How, how is that factored into splitting them up? Well, when we looked at it originally, just for the purposes of this plan, prior to the survey going out to parents to see where really parents are sitting, that's just the, the split down the middle. It's actually um, A to L, A, M, M, and then pick up from there. Um, but certainly um, pending the parent survey and how we can drill down into those details, um, at least at the elementary level, we would have to go back and look at the class rosters that we were that we created and there may be or have to be some adjustments to that based on survey results. Thank you. Yeah, we'd be the same, John. We'd be look, looking at what the balance is going to look like there. Um, and I know another question that's been brought up is, you know, what if we have a couple different last names living in the same household? Of course, we would work to make sure that those students attended on the same day. 
we certainly don't want parents to have to split up their children if that does not work for them. So, you know, and I think the more we get into this, there's going to be a lot of different variables that are out there um, that we'll have to, you know, try to address as they pop up. Um, and we really have been referring to those as any special considerations, mm -hmm. um, you know, as we are receiving um, questions like that. Thank you. You're welcome. So the next hybrid model that we had looked at, another one that's out there is consecutive days. Um, you'll notice that on the Monday and Tuesday, group, group A's are attending remote learning and then group B's for Thursday and Friday. Um, you know, one of the pros that's thrown out there for this is you have your kids two consecutive days. You know, you hope that there's a little bit of retention that's going on from one day to the next. Um, but then, you know, they're losing some direct contact for, for five days. And so, um, you know, that's certainly a con to this one, Jen. I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to jump in on with that well, one. I think it's the um, same kind of split when we put the survey out to the um, 115 committee members. Um, you know, there certainly are considerations um, with regard to our special education students and their retention of information when presented um, two days in a row. Um, and, and again, there are pros and cons to both of these um, hybrid models when you look at it for elementary and middle school students. Um, and that's what we're hoping for additional um, information and, you know, um, survey information from our parents. Yeah, another challenge that um, I had heard from others about with this is if a student assigned to group B happened to be sick on that Thursday and maybe was out Friday, there's the potential for them to be out nearly a week or more of school. Uh, so, that, you know, was another consideration. Now we could certainly look at um, making accommodations and bringing that kid, kid back to school and flipping the group for a period of time. Uh, lots of things just to think about. But this was split 60-40 on the survey that we put out to our full committee. I do um, think, Ryan, just to interrupt for a second, your example is a perfect example of how the – emails that have been coming to the reopening email address and any conversations that people have had with committee members are shaping this very plan. That was a great example of that. All right. Um, so let's look at high school is a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> there are some certain variables with high school that we don't necessarily have to work around at the elementary or middle level. Um, that being, you know, participation in our BOCES programs, um, seat time for students, whether students are taking advanced or college level classes or are duly enrolled. So some other considerations that will need to be made at a high school, high school level. Um, but here we're looking at a very similar model, I guess, in a sense. However, they're on a four-day rotation, um, whereas at the middle level we're two. Uh, this has to do somewhat with science labs that rotate on a four-day basis as well. Um, Erie One BOCES put out a guidance document. I'm not sure if that was finalized or in draft form, um, but listed, you know, one of the days that Frontier would be attending. And so that's what the breakdown here basically was. Um, so Wednesday not being full virtual at this point anyways, and certainly all this is subject to plan, subject to change as we work with the high school staff and you know, sort of get into the weeds of the challenges. But right now, looking at a two-week rotation in a sense where kids would be going every other day in person. Um, scrolling down. Um, you know, and I should say, too, regardless of whatever plan is selected, it's the, the committee's commitment to create a calendar that will be sent to all of the parents indicating exactly what days their children would be required to attend in-person instruction. So we're not expecting people to necessarily memorize all of this. We would probably send that out on a quarterly basis. Like here's your days of attendance, here's um, virtual days, and really doing that to plan around staff development days. We know there's gonna be some holidays on Monday and we wanna make sure that we're accounting for that and kids are still getting you know, their two to three days in person um, if we indeed need to go this virtual option. Um, a third consideration that we had here was to look at our kindergarten and first grade numbers as we get towards uh, the end of August. You know, depending on what those numbers may say, we could possibly look at students attending more regularly than two or three days. Um, that would just depend on how things shake out. And again, survey results on 
the number of parents who are keeping kids home versus keeping kids uh, enrolled actually in whatever model that we are going to go with. Fourth consideration is full-time virtual plan. Um, you know, there's been, I would say, some conflicting guidance at this point from different outside groups saying whether this has to be offered even if there's no pre-existing medical condition or not. I, I'm suspecting we're gonna have a full virtual option at some point. Um, you know, that will be something, again, that we'll work with Dr. Hughes and his cabinet on, um, making sure that, you know, we certainly meet the needs of all kids um, and whether they're able to be here or not, and whether it's medically necessary or a comfort level for parents. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's all of them, right, Jen? Yeah, I didn't know Dr. Hughes has a, um, an illustration if you wanna present that. I can, yeah, you want me to pull it up? Could you run? Yeah. Sure. It just is a, uh, a visual representation of all the things that Ryan went through. Thank you, Ryan, for articulating all of those. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I think Before I kind of dive in into this piece, I want to thank uh, Mr. Kopecki and Mr. Sikorsky um, and all the committee members that are, have been doing a lot of time on this. Um, download. Go for it. As Jen said, there's not any true answers. Um, I think the year, the, the word for this year is going to be flexible because we are looking at constant changes coming from Albany. Um, our governor's made comments about testing lately and well, we, we're supposed to screen, but we're not supposed to be testing for COVID. We don't have the capacity. We're not health professionals. So um, that worries me that the decision coming out of Albany may, may make it where we don't have much of a choice going forward. Uh, that we may go virtual or those kind of pieces. But based on the feedback of the committee, um, I, a colleague of mine in Batavia, um, Mr. Solar, um, was nice enough to lend us his kind of format and we've cut, you know, Mrs. Lysing did a great job of tweaking it. We want to give parents as much choice as possible. And I, th I think Ryan and Jen have said that um, as they have they talked about the committee comments, the, the emails we received, there is not any one plan that people are going to agree on. So how do we provide um, those choices? So being able to provide a virtual option, um, that's the cohort there at the bottom, where students would attend virtual every single day. Um, we know parents want that option. So we want to make sure we can we offer that option. So as you fill out the survey for every child, make sure you put down, because they could be at different grade levels, and different buildings, please make sure you put down that you're if you're choosing that virtual option. Because all of a sudden we have 20% of our student body reduced by a virtual option. That means we only have 3,500 students versus 4,700 students coming to the building. So then the high school is you know, definitely a different beast because of the CTE programs and things like that. So that's where the AB um, lays out there. So cohort three really is that AB cohort that goes back and forth at the high school levels. And it doesn't have a split by alphabet. Since A days of BOCES day for Frontier, all students, there's about 160 at the juniors and senior level for CT alone that would have to be on that A day. We'd have to make sure we tackle that. Uh, for students with special consideration, um, as it says in cohort four, trying to get them, getting them to attend every day. We are one of the only districts um, in our area besides Lakeshore and Erie two BOCES, running a summer school special education program and they're meeting every day during the summer here and it's gone very well. Um, I give kudos to the staff and the special ed department, everybody involved in, in doing so. So we can, if we can have students here every day and target it with any kind of special considerations. So the, if there's a bunch of students that are doing virtual learning and then we have the hybrid as the, as the main piece. We will take as many students in that everyday piece as we possibly can from a staffing component and from a capacity component. So we want to offer the three options. The one option and the everyday option really has to have some kind of special considerations to it. I can tell you my four are not going to fall under special considerations. 
a lot of parents may not like that. Maybe special considerations, job related. Those are the kind of things we're gonna have to piece out on a case by case basis. But the hybrid model is the central model. And then if our numbers stay low, more people come back. But anybody that chooses a virtual model, we'd like you to choose and select it for at least a, a semester trimester so that it's locked in. That will also let us know what the capacity of our buses are. Um, if we stagger our elementary times where we have, you know, one of the options we're looking at is if we have, say, if we have Blaisdell and Pinehurst matched up, that's about a thousand students. Cloverbank and Big Tree patched up is about a thousand students. That means capacity of our buses is every single kid rode the bus from those buildings at that time. That means 20 to 25 kids could be on that bus socially distanced wearing their mask because they have to wear masks unless they have a medical reason not to, we could transport those thousand kids using 50 buses. We don't have 85 buses to be able to run everybody all at the same time. So we'd have to stagger um, some of those pieces. Those are the things we're looking at in particular, but putting a calendar out as, as Jenna Ryan mentioned, that will be our next step based on the feedback that comes back. We need to know especially that virtual piece and who's willing to transport, who wants to transport their own child and feels safer transporting their own child. That survey would dictate how many kids can be are hybrid, how many kids are virtual, and ultimately how many kids are on an everyday basis, depending on the decisions coming out of Albany. Hey, Rich, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Who's going to teach the virtual option? If I'm reading this right, I understand this a good portion may pick virtual, but these teachers are teaching every day. So where are we getting the staff to do the virtual piece? Well, there are some teachers that are more um, willing to do the virtual piece. We already have a number of staff members, number of teachers who have asked for an accommodation um, because of whatever medical and other reasons to not be able to, so they don't return to work because they, they may fall into one of the categories that are endangered by COVID. And that's where we've got to figure out, based on parent feedback and our staffing, what fits where. Um, otherwise, you know, we choose a hybrid option for everybody, but I, I think it makes the most sense to, you know, really give options and try to match our staffing um, to those options and maximize it as much as possible. So that in-person learning, whether it's in-person or connecting through Zoom, as Jen said, and I said it uh, to Ron Plants today, there's no replacement for in-person in learning. There just isn't. Some kids may accelerate, but the vast majority aren't going to. And then you talk social emotional, our kids need to connect with other kids and our teachers and our staff. Um, so, you know, trying to mesh this and provide options is really what, what we're trying to do. Hey, Rich. Do we have, will we have contractual issues with staggered starts? I mean, I don't know how big of a, how, how big of a variation the stagger is. Is it 15 minutes or is it an hour? Um, well, the contract doesn't, it says how much time during the day. It does not state, you know, a start time and end time. Um, and I know some won't like that answer, but some will be totally fine with it. When it comes down to it, you know, I know SCTA and FCEA, we're all trying to work together to do what's best. Uh, we have a number of staff members that are most likely not going to come back. We have some additional retirements probably happening because of, uh, of the current pandemic. So trying to take everybody's individual cases into account um, and the preponderance of, of information that Jen and Ryan put, put together along with the committees, I think the committees tackled every single what if that has come up, including those that anybody who sent questions into the board, myself or anybody else, or the reopening committee, I think they, I, I think they've taken every single possible what if into account. Thank you. A quick question. Uh, this document that we're being shown is going to be made available to our families? Correct. If this is, you know, asking for board feedback, if, you know, we want to try to make the options work, um, asking your feedback, if you think this makes sense, um, I would have no problem going out on a limb and saying we want to attempt <coughs> these options and just knowing that not every kid is going to be able to come back every day. Um, virtual is really the first foundational piece of all this that will determine what um, the number of students we have in our buildings. One question we did get, so we're looking at 50% capacity, basically. We're looking at social distancing. So for the high school on any given day, if everybody 
was able to come to school and they all did and they weren't doing virtual, we would have at most 700 kids in the building when we have about 1400 students at the high school. At the middle school level, that's about 550 when we have, you know, many more than, we have more than double that. Big Tree would be 260, Blaisdell would be 240, Clover Bank would be 280, and Piners would be 310. Those are the 50% capacity pieces. If those numbers go down because of more students taking the virtual option, which say it's 20%, maybe it's 20% at the elementary level, maybe it's 20% at the, maybe it's a higher percentage, maybe 30% at the middle school, but it's only 10% at the elementary school. That's when we'll work to maximize our space and spread out that capacity pieces to, to make as many of these options happen for every individual case we can. Okay, and I don't wanna be nitpicky. I just, Please. I'm noticing here on the student cohorts, it says cohort one, students last name A through K. However, on the re-entry document, it says A through L. So I just know as someone who monitors parent pages, I'm I'm definitely going to get some questions on that. So is it A through L or is it A through K? Well, I think Ryan answered it pretty well before, right? Was it Ryan or Jen that said? Yeah. The actual split is, split is A through L-A-M-M -M, <laughs> and then L-A-M-P picks up to Z. So then, the, you know, probably the K makes most sense. And that's where the changes are going to occur. Based, if we have more kids at the beginning of the alphabet to take the virtual option, it will change the alphabet. I, I understand that. I just know I'm going to get questions based on what they're seeing here. So I, I so I, I wrote that down. L A M M L A M P. Got it. Hey, I've got two general questions. If I could, the first one is pretty straightforward. When is the survey due back? I don't, you know what? I don't think we actually set an end date. I would hope you know maybe four or five days. We sort of need to, okay. to get rolling on it. I, I do know based on our previous experience with sending these out, they come back very quickly. Like Ryan monitors exactly what is coming back very quickly. So we do notice that people jump on that. Um, so it, yeah, it will be important for that. One of the things pieces we need to identify is who does not have an email address in our system. Um, so we're trying to isolate who those folks are and we will make phone calls either to get an email address to send it or to um, conduct the survey over the phone. And we'll also follow up with a letter to everybody in the district. So we're hitting it multiple ways besides social media, besides email. We're, we're going to hit it as many ways as we possibly can. And that, that sets up for my second question, which we talked about briefly. Um, so I, I don't know if you guys can answer or not. What is the working backwards? What is the drop dead date that we have to make a decision as a district to say which plan we're going to do? I mean, I really think the governor is going to come out and say to us, it's New York statistics look good. The percentages are low enough. Schools should reopen. He's going to leave it to the districts to work with the parents or the PTA or whoever. So it's going to fall to us to say, okay, this is the model we're going to use. And, and so many things depend on if we're all virtual or hybrid. And the answer is one of those two, um, I think. So what, what are you thinking the third week in August? There's got to be some date that we've got to decide by, right? So you can get all these logistics in place. Well, I think honestly, this is the proposal. It's multi, It's the three options to do so. Once we figure out the virtual people, uh, the virtual students, 10, 20%, whatever it may be. We're hybrid, but we're trying to do provide virtual on one end and then as much in-person time to as many kids as possible for parents for special consideration, those that, that want so. So honestly, this, this really is our is our decision. The only thing that could change it, if the governor says you can't be in person or he says, you know what, all of you are going in person. Those are the kind of things, you know, being in the middle allows, and this is something that both chairs and uh, I think the committee talked about, allows the flexibility that if the numbers don't go up in the fall and they stay low and there's a, maybe there's a vaccine. Yeah. There's a lot of what ifs there. Well, I don't, I don't think the governor can say everybody's going to be there because I think even if he says that, and like I, like I said before, even if he says that and we get 50 or maybe 100 parents that don't send their kids, you right. can chase them truancy-wise. If we get 1,000 families that don't send their kids, I would like to believe we're going to offer virtual. So the answer is is virtual and hybrid, and I'm just yes. – this is just a gargantuan task. And I, my hat's off to Jen and Ryan and the whole committee. This is a, This is really a big deal. 
Oh, to the survey, just jumping on that quick, we are tailoring the questions so they're as um, concise as possible. So we're not doing somewhat agree, partially agree, maybe I agree. We want to get hard data from this to be able to use. Um, so really, you know, it's with that, it's going to be quick. Um, yeah. So hopefully we'll get, we'll get the results back pretty quickly. Yeah, and I think, I think one thing you're going to see, Ryan, and you've seen it already, is, you know, the board got a bunch of questions we were CC'd on to the committee. I don't know, I counted about 30, and they were at both ends of the spectrum. So mm -hmm. I'm really, I think your survey is going to come back with half the people saying we want virtual and half saying we need to be back in school, I, I you know. And, and Pat, to that end, I'm struggling still with the economics of it. I got two questions, Rich. Has the state changed the course requirements, for example, anything that requires a lab? if someone goes virtual or remote? Lab lab requirements, the SED uh, did approve in July at their meeting, all the things they put in place last year. So labs can be in-person and or virtual accommodation. Um, they have not made any decisions say on reason exams, but I would suspect if we're not fully in, in place that you won't see reason exams this year again. You won't see three through eight testing as well. So then with the hybrid and virtual, I can get my head around it at the elementary level where I'm struggling a little bit to understand it at the middle school and high school. So I'm guessing others will as well. Let's say I'm a student doing virtual and, and what my bio, my physics and my pre-calc teacher, are te they're all busy all week and no one's available to teach those classes is because they're specialized at the high school level. How does that get dealt with? Well, they, we have to have a contact with every student every day. So there is no, they're gonna be busy. So it, it's gonna be part of their schedule. They'll have a number of students most likely, um, depending on if we have a teacher who's, uh, you know, a math teacher who can't come in and they're virtual, they may have an allotment of students that are purely virtual or a combination thereof. So it's really gonna be piecemealing case by case as much as possible. Thank you. Jen Ryan, great, great presentation, by the way. Um, I have a question. So, or a question for the whole group, I can be a little topic here. With yesterday with the governor, he mentioned in his briefing there that we should be testing 15% of our students. How would we test 750 students a week randomly? Well, that's where I'll jump into that one. I don't want Jen Ryan to dive into that chaos. Um, Thank you. I think I think what you're hinting at is I don't know how we do. I don't know how we, we, we're going to screen as, be, as best we can. Parents are really going to be responsible, as many other districts are doing it. Parents need to be responsible to check their child's temperature and see if there's any symptoms. We'll also be doing those things. But there's not a testing capacity right now. If the state and the nation doesn't have the testing capacity going on, how are we going to have tests available to test students? And then all of a sudden we're into a medical area that when you talk HIPAA, FERPA, all these issues, that's not a school district's role. We, we don't have doctors on site. We don't have, you know, medical professionals. We, well, we do, we have our nurses, but that's not, that can't be their role either. They're going to be helping us, helping us um, along the way to make sure we're as safe as we possibly can. But as you saw in Indiana, they get halfway through the first school day, school district had a high school kid with COVID. You're seeing it pop up around the country. So we're, you know, five, four or five weeks out from starting, five weeks out from starting as of today with our staff. What I think you're gonna see, and hope I'm wrong, as other states experience these difficulties with schools reopening, you're gonna see more fear. You're gonna see more, more, more people scared about sending their kids back to school, which pushes more of the virtual option. And at the state level, you know, if those numbers are growing and other states are seeing this um, this issue of students coming back and it blowing the numbers up, I could easily see, you know, at the, at the, in Albany saying, you know, with the numbers going the way they're trending, we, we can't open. I think you're right. I think it's very contradictory to what our governor has said before about the testing when you look back at his previous briefings and other things. Um, yeah, he never mentioned testing before and the la on Saturday and yesterday he did and uh, there might be an article in the newspaper tomorrow or on TV 
talking about the governor's choice of the word testing for schools, which is not which is not in the guidance. Screening it, not testing. Right. What is going to be the cost to the district to operate as the way you propose? Um, I don't think there's going to be as big a cost. Um, the issue, you know, some school districts are trying to go fully, but if as time evolves, I don't think those plans necessarily are going to stay in place with having, you know, students come back. I would say that uh, many of the conversations I've had with those superintendents, initially we all thought we can come back. We got everybody wearing masks, we got precautions, and that's changed very quickly because we're seeing spikes in other states. Um, it, there's, there's definitely a fear to this. Um, and some people don't believe there's a, whether they don't believe that COVID is gonna impact them or it's gonna affect kids. Um, well, it's gonna affect our staff. It's gonna, not just our teachers, but it's gonna affect our, our civil service personnel who on average are older. Those are the kind of pieces that in the next five weeks, this could all vastly change. So the word for the year is flexible. We could end up maybe getting closer to full in person but not everybody's going to come back full in person because of the, their their own their own health concerns, their family's health concerns, their neighbors, their you know their grandparents' health concerns. Whoever in their family, they got to be able to make a decision that works for them and us providing as their frontier family, us providing that option for them. But if you know ninety percent of our kids can come back and we're allowed to because the numbers stay low, I would love to see all of our kids back in the buildings. As a realist, as a scientist, a biologist, and chemist at heart, this is not going away anytime soon. Hey, Rich, one thing I just like to throw in, and, and I know we're all seeing the, I'm going to call it the fear factor going up on the, on the kids returning to school. But one thing I'm very concerned about is all these kids, you know, their health is certainly number one, but their mental and emotional state too. They're not interacting with other kids. And I, you know, I read several districts opening plans last weekend, and I think it was Williamsville that talked about grades like K through three going five days a week. Because one of the things I was thinking about, maybe that's why they're doing it, I don't know, is, is you know, are we gonna, if this goes on for, God forbid, 18 months or two years, which it could, are we gonna have a, a 10 years from now, a group of kids that didn't get their basic math and reading skills, those young kids? And I'm just, I'm really concerned and, and not even to mention the, the mental health and, you know, God forbid we have some kids that, we're not seeing. So if there's bad things happening at home, nobody's seeing these kids. So I know we all, we like, like Jen said at the beginning, we need to get these kids back in school, but this is a, a fine balance between, you know, the kids, their health safety and then socioeconomic and also their, their learning for the future. And Pat, just the work of the social emotional learning committee um, has been vast in what um, they're thinking about, regardless of whether we are um, hybrid or remote. Um, and how do we meet the needs of not only students, but their families. And just the curriculum piece, just to speak to a little bit, we have received emails from parents, but have also had meaningful conversations about ensuring that new learning is happening. Mm -hmm. You know, when we were thrust into an extended closure, it was hard to monitor that. And certainly the, um, the increased expectations for all of us around that new learning um, is, is greater than ever, um, just so that we don't miss those gaps um, in those periods that you're talking about and how do we make up for, you know, what students didn't have in second grade coming to third grade. Um, you know, those are really the next steps of vertical conversations between grade levels about what didn't we get to and here's a good place for you to start. Well, that's good to hear. Thank you. Jumping in on that, John, our, our teams here and I know around the district did a really sound job getting to know what kids struggled with the virtual component. And so we look at those special consideration groups, and maybe one of my three kids had a real tough time with it. You know, we have the data to show that they only logged into one or two meetings, that they didn't complete a number of the assignments. Maybe that's a kid that we approach a parent and say, you know, based on how last year ended, we want to start them here a little bit more regularly than two to five, two to three days a week. Um, so we have that data. There also is going to be a survey question or two that asks parents um, whether they experience any difficulties in social emotional behaviors, such as anxiety, depression, aggressive behaviors during this time. And if the answer to that is yes, you know, those kids are going to go right into um, 
I don't want to say a database, but they're going to be on our radar for our, for our social workers and our counselors to connect with a little bit more often. So if I may jump in for a second, um, we are having vertical conversations this summer um, in the, the core areas right now, um, looking at what standards we're going to be focusing on um, and really looking at those first few weeks of school, no matter what, what the plan is to, to assess where kids are um, and to also not just assess where they are academically, but where they are emotionally. Um, and there has to be contact with students every single day. We, we have to work on that and get that into place. Um, no one can slip through the cracks. You know, there's going to be things in place. Hey, Jen, Ryan, and Rich, a question for you, and it's sort of broad based, so let me explain it. Social distancing, what are we using for a definition? Because maybe I'm confused, and if I am, maybe others are. It's my understanding if they're wearing a mask, the six feet gap is not there, correct? Um, originally, the guidance said six feet or a mask. Right. And then a few days later, the SED guidance changed to six feet and a mask. Mm -hmm. And that's still where it sits. That's still where it sits. Um, the governor's office has been asked by numerous people across the state for clarification on that. Um, and if you're if you're in music, if you're a singer or play an instrument where you have to project wind. 12 feet. Or you're around me where I project wind all the time, but I'm coming out of my mouth, I guess. It's 12 feet. So there's a challenge, even if we are in person or every other day or whatever the case would be, how can you have a large group? You can't awesome bands and symphonies that we have and courses that we have, how could you have that as a large group? So hearing our teachers talk about ideas like, well, smaller groups in just a larger space. So we have awesome professionals that are coming up with every possible idea on the sun to solve these problems, problems that we've never had to deal with before. So part B then is the question I've probably been asked most, because it is six feet and a mask, when they're sitting down, the mask has to stay on. There are breaks that are allowed to occur to do so. Um, it should be both. Masks should be worn as much as possible, but they can take them off. They're sitting down. Um, some districts um, have spent close to a million dollars, um, similar size to us, on shield around the desks. Um, but uh, I don't know how many, I know many of you have experienced little ones. Um, I'm sure those will end up flying at some point, whether it's a karate kick or being knocked over and those pieces that all of a sudden if we're virtual, if we do try to do something like that, we're looking at just our K-1, it would cost us $200,000. That's three teachers versus shields that really may not, as long as we're socially distanced and using the mask, that, that really may not um, assist with that issue. I have a so rich, like, question. Go ahead, Marty. Okay. Uh, how about the safety aspects of it? Uh, the buses, uh, the classrooms, the lunchroom. How do you take a mask off if a child's sitting across from you I, to eat? Well, that's where everything is going to get marked off. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason and Food Surfer have already been working on plans to mark off, you know, rooms. Um, I think, you know, Jen and Ryan can talk to some of the ideas they have that they've been sharing with those committees and the committees have been sharing with them? Yeah, I think the important piece to, when you look at the document is the assurances that are in there um, are there to address just those concerns that you're talking about, Marty. What would it look like if, a, if students were in the cafeteria? How many could, students could we fit there? What would the arrangement look like? And those are all pieces that we need to drill down into further. Um, and, and we had... Uh, in our conversations today with subcommittee members, all of those subcommittees are really specialized in their own area, and they have a lot of recommendations around that. And then the next part of the conversation is building principals, building administrators saying, okay, identify in your spaces, given these constraints, what do you think that would look like in your building? And those are, and, and it is not lost on any of us that it is August 4th. So we are committed to putting in all of the time, everything that needs to happen to make sure that we are opening and receiving students and employees 
in the safest way possible that adheres to all of the guidelines. So those are some of those when you look at those assurances that say communicate and share. Those are still some of those protocols, those written protocol pieces um, that are being worked on right now, including what does it look like in the cafeteria? Well, I think one of the terms that you hear flying around a lot is cohorting. And if you're unfamiliar with it, it's pretty similar to what currently happens in an elementary school where kids simply aren't changing classes like they used to. And I would say when kids are coming back, make no mistake about it, it's not half kids coming back how school used to be. That's that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about kids who at a middle and high school level may be carrying around backpacks. They may not be accessing lockers anymore. We have survey questions here for food service to see who even needs to attend the cafeteria to retrieve food. So we may have kids eating in classrooms. We may have kids eating in small gyms in certain buildings. Um, you know, I, I, I hate that those words came out of my mouth, that it won't be the same as, as kids are accustomed to. But, um, you know, when we look at the instructional component, I guess it outweighs all of the precautions that we need to take and having kids back in our buildings. But. You know, we're going to be looking at teachers traveling to classrooms at upper levels and, um, you know, really minimizing the amount of travel that's taking place in our buildings, which... The other component, too, from an elementary perspective, when you look at our art, music, library, and phys ed teachers and the importance of what they offer to our students and um, their engagement with our students, that is, again, another one of those drill-down pieces. So... We've invited them to a meeting to talk about what might their role look like, understanding that their um, curricular piece to what we do every day in the classroom is equally as important as those, you know, core subject areas that we talk about. Um, so they're very eager um, to share some brainstorming ideas that they have um, and how we can work together, um, again, to welcome as many students back as we can. That's a really important piece of the next piece of the work that needs to be done. Well, case in point with the food service, I just got a text from Mr. Whipple. So shout out to Mr. Whipple from food service watching online. Um, basically, one thing you're not going to have, you're not going to have lines. You're not going to have those limbo lines snaking around the cafeteria. You know, so it's, everything's going to be a little bit more highly scheduled and spread out. As you see, when you go to a restaurant, it's going to be Space. It's been a really good conversation so far. I thank you everyone for your questions and all that. Uh, Mr. Tiplock, you got something else? I do. So today, I mean, I understand that we're we're on a Zoom and we're having a remote meeting when we're talking about kids going back to school. It's to me, it's kind of tough. Um, my, I coach little league baseball. So I've really realized how hard it is to keep little guys distant. So I can go to the dugout and I spread all the bags and everything like that. And I look over and I got nine little kids, you know, playing rock, paper, scissors and, you know, talking about Fortnite. So what happens when they go back to school and that happens or is, I mean, are these children going to be reprimanded for being kids? I mean, it's just one, something you got to think about because, like, it's that's the last thing I would want my own son to have, right? Sure. Going to school to be a kid and going to learn, but yet they're being reprimanded for being kids. So that's always been one of my biggest questions with going back. And I, when it first happened, when sports were distance sports were allowed to happen, you could really see that a lot of boys needed the social activity because there were some kids that came back and that weren't just. They were, you know, they missed the social, you know, the social part of it. But I guess that's my biggest question: is what happens when these children do come back and they want to be kids? I think that's, you know, I think that's probably the concern of everybody that we talk to. Um, certainly, we have missed that um, having students in our buildings, you know, for the last fifteen weeks of school. Um, and how do we reimagine what their education is going to look like? until we have a vaccine, um, that's the challenge for all of us. One of the things that I think we all love best about students um, is that they're eager to learn and they're eager to show you what they can do. So if we teach them what this new learning looks like and what this new classroom looks like, um, while it's going to be challenging, 
um, it is certainly something that I know that they will embrace. It's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of repetition. It's going to take a lot of education. It's going to take a lot of modeling. Um, but we certainly, when they are face-to-face and in person, we want to practice what their new social distance guidelines and interactions with each other will be. Um, and that's the, the goal of our whole, um, not only just our committee, but all of us, all of our teachers, um, and a big part of that, you know, social emotional learning piece, because the biggest thing is, like you said, you know, they want to be with one another. They have missed each other for so very long. I think jumping in on that, Jen, we're approaching the start of a school year as a celebration. Like you made it 20 weeks type of thing where we're going to set the table in a really positive manner. You know, and we talked at committee meetings and Jen and I have talked with our building level colleagues, like the first few weeks, we're just going to talk and have conversation, real conversations and just get the pulse of how everyone's doing. Um, you know, things that we've missed for a long time and we all do different character ed components in our schools, but really taking those first few weeks just to talk through some certain issues that kids have dealt with and acknowledging the struggle that's been out there. You know, and I would say probably all of our teachers and our staff have had similar struggles and letting them know that it's okay and relating it to them by the things that we've dealt with too. So we're gonna set it up so that everyone's gonna jump off successful from the start of the school year for sure. I think you're right. I think it's a delicate balance because obviously they wanna get together and share as Dan said. And I think we just have to remind them that, okay, we're glad you're all here and we can see each other, but we have to remember some of these things. Uh, Ryan, you mentioned backpacks and I guess that's one of my concerns because we originally, if you remember, took backpacks kind of away from the students because of safety concerns with the horrible things that have gone on in this country with violence. So now to say, okay, we're giving you your backpack back, I, you know, we also have to be flexible. I understand that, but we also have to err on the side of safety. So how will that look? Yeah, I think that the thought behind that was kids won't be traveling um, as much from room to room. So having those just be stationed with their, their things or limiting. So maybe they get what they need in the morning with a staggered type of start. Maybe they get everything they need for their morning classes. And at lunchtime, they switch to their afternoon stuff. So um, just in the thought was limiting the congregation there. And I'm sure if we think, uh, think on it with different committees, we could probably come up with a plan to, you know, limit the number of kids there, but we were just trying to avoid, I mean, right. fall through middle high schools and see how tight those lockers are with, with they are. Our taller kids. And so, you know, just in the interest of safety, but it, it, it's something that we've, we've gone round and round on because you're right. We've, we've finally won the no backpack battle and here we're going to give it all, give it back. <laughs> um, but to the point about starting school, one other thing I wanted to mention was, you know, the intention there too is really going to teach students expectations about what virtual learning should look like. We didn't have that option necessarily in person when we needed to close our doors within a day and come up with this plan. You know, the, the, the plan moving forward will be to, you know, throw these expectations out to kids, have teachers come up with things that are realistic for on those virtual days, here is what you need to do. We don't want our parents, parents have enough battles going on at home. We don't want them to have to police this as well. So we wanna really get um, concrete expectations for our kids and teach those the first few weeks, um, as well as all of the other stuff in the event that they're going virtual more often than not. Again, all really good um, questions and discussions. I was thinking of your comment, Dr. Costello, because I remember at some point in my schooling, um, you know, during all of it, it was, you can't, couldn't have backpacks, but there was a point where we weren't able to go to our lockers because, you know, some student did something, pulled a prank or something like that. I don't remember, but, um, you know, it's difficult to carry all of your things without a backpack. So, um, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's a very, like you say, it's like trying to balance things. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, I apologize. Um, we do have our student representative ex officio member, although the, allow, the law doesn't allow her to vote or to go into executive session, she is a board member. So I should have included her in the road call, the roll call that's Avery Um And as a you know 
student ex officio board member, she has the right to um, you know, ask questions, um, make co comments, um, and maybe all of her comments or questions were already answered or she doesn't have any, so I'm not putting her on the spot, but I just wanted to make sure she kn knew that she could um, you know, ask those things, especially because obviously this, this will directly impact her and her um, peers. Um, so what that does, any other, uh, whether it's Avery or any other board members, do you have any questions or comments? I know that we're sending that survey out to, you know, our, our families. Do we have any, you know, intentions of sending a survey out to our faculty and staff or are we relying on our unions to represent those employees? Because of the issues, anybody who doesn't think they can return has to put in for an accommodation. Um, can't just do a survey and ask for people who wants to and who doesn't want to come back. We've got to follow contract pieces and also the uh, laws and regulations that have come up because of the COVID piece. So, you know, we, we have one or two that were coming already. Um, as, as we've talked with all the units already, please make sure your members know that the sooner we know um, that they have, they have concerns um, that stops them from coming back to work, um, the easier it will be for us to plan around those pieces. I have one more final question, if you don't mind. Um, Liability-wise, these teachers are taking on a great risk or a great task of having students in their class, either depending on which depending on which model they go with, right? What you say if you did hybrid or you know uh, whatever model that was at the time. So are they responsible for cleaning their own classrooms? And then what happens at after that session leaves school? Like how are the buses disinfected and what's going on with the cleaning at night? Like what's gonna be different? Our cleaners will have the appropriate materials. They'll be doing that every night. Some districts are talking about a deep clean on Wednesday, but in reality, we need to clean every night. Buses will clean after every trip. Um, our teachers will not be doing the cleaning. That is not their job description. Right. Uh, that would be taking work away from also our cleaners and custodians. Um, so those schedules will be will be part of what we do. If we have to hire additional people to meet that demand, we would do so. So if if a child did get it, like I would, as a teacher, I'd feel terrible if I was a teacher and I had a child in my class get COVID in the classroom because I mean obviously there'd be some sort of, I'm sure they would feel some sort of responsibility there as well. So I think that's a great undertaking as well. It is. And that's where the, you know, from a liability standpoint, um, just as many, many places have been open, whether it's medical facilities, you know, stores and, and places like that, um, we're all taking an inherent risk leaving our homes at any point. So, um, and, and our, our buildings are filled with people that all they do is care about kids. Oh, I get that. Teachers, Jennifer, Ryan, yeah. Principals, what do you guys think of like the responsibility? I mean, I, we go into every, at least I go into every school year with safety being a number one priority. Parents trust us. Grandparents trust us, aunts and uncles trust us with their greatest possession that they have. Um, so for me, we're looking at it as a different kind of safety net. You know, and I don't want to lose sight of some of the other things that we've put in place to make sure kids are safe. Um, this is just another hurdle we got to get over. Uh, you know, I I'm, I'm, don't want to think about the potential of kids or staff members getting sick because that's just not where my mind goes. I want to, Think about them um, coming back and and getting the education they could, you know, seeing their friends again. But I'm not naive to the fact that it can't happen. Um, so you know, we'll meet with staff if everyone comes back. We'll make sure our protocols are crystal clear to everybody, and we'll do our best to make sure that we're um, doing what we can for kids and parents. But from a liability standpoint, I I can't do my job effectively and think about if I'm liable for anything, if that makes sense. No, I get it. Thank you. I just, the cleaning was, I've always been interested in the cleaning, especially with the buses and the social distancing and the buses as well. Um, but our people here are top notch, like Dr. Hughes said, like we, they get it, you know, and, and they, when we talk to kids, the opening week of school, 
I let them know every adult is here for you. And if you're not comfortable talking to me or your teacher and you want to talk to the custodian, feel free to do that. And we have our opening meetings with all of our staff and they know the reasons they're here. And so we all work around that mission and do what's best for you. I, I think the important thing too is always keeping in mind each and every day the health and security and well being of all of our students and all of our employees and not to lose sight of that. I think even, you know, um, sitting in an empty building at times over the you know the last fifteen weeks of school, it just sends a message that, you know, you miss the what happens in a school and you know the enjoyment and the engagement that kids and teachers get out of interactions with students. It's going to be a very emotional day on September 9th, no matter how you look at it, for adults and students alike. Um, I appreciate the question because it's something um, is important to us. Hey, Rick, do we have enough staff to do two shifts of, of cleaning? What will be happening during the day? And given the cohorts will be in the room, in the nightly room cleaning, are there enough hours in the day with the staff we have to do? Well, cleaning during the day, that's why we're minimizing the cohorts. You know, if, you, if you're at the elementary level, you're not leaving that room, um, except for rare instances to do so. Those kids are going to stay in that room. Those are the kind of pieces that uh, are going to be, you know, the basis of, you know, least movement as possible. Is basically what's going to turn into it. Same thing at the high school level. So the cleaning will be at the high at, at uh, really after hours, and we'll have people going in. Um, doing the cleaning of the bathrooms during the day and pieces like that. And we'll staff up with as many people as we need to, to make sure that happens. And that's all going to come down to, you know, these numbers could change based on how many people choose virtual versus uh, those other kind of pieces. And us having a summer school this summer at Big Tree for a number of our students um, has given us a leg up on putting these procedures in place. My last question, which is the biggest problem with pro sports, how are we going to do restrooms at the middle school and high school level? It's going to be uh, not people are going to be wandering. Right. But let's say different classes. How do you know how many kids can go at once? How is that going to be regulated to make sure that we keep the social distancing in the bathrooms? Yeah, I think for, for at least our level, we're going to look at staffing. So typically, um, you know, we'll have some teacher aides that we can utilize for that. We've utilized them for locker rooms uh, at the middle level, supervision and locker rooms. And, you know, if there's a period where teachers don't necessarily need them, we'll have them with walkie-talkies just, you know, not necessarily, I don't want to say performing a hall monitor duty, but filling their time um, being that adult presence. And so, you know, if they're circulating around and we could have one on one floor and one on another, that would probably be a way that we would start that. But certainly something to note and something that we can talk further on with our facilities committee. I think the high school has a number of monitors, so I don't know if it would be as big of an issue there. I think too, John, that one of the things when you look at the document, you know, um, these pages then become checklists. So when you look at the assurances under any subcommittee title, um, it just becomes okay um, do, have we done this? Check. So we're now turning this document into a checklist um, for us so that we can make sure that, you know, we have covered everything. I think any time that students are, even when pre-COVID, when students are in non-supervised um, situations, it's really that education around what the expectation should look like. So, you know, wearing those masks, washing their hands, um, and that again comes with that education and that um, repetition of expectations. I'm sure too we'll establish a number that's safe and if you see more than that and come out wait um, being part of the expectation but there's going to be a lot of new routines that we're going to have to think of that we're going to need to explicitly teach and it's um, going to be a challenge for sure. Thank one, you. one last one and then I think I'm good. Uh, classroom size. What are you guys thinking for like the average classroom size? Well, if we're fifty percent capacity, you know, generally our elementary class has been twenty-four kids. Uh, if we're fifty percent, that gets you down to twelve, um, if not ten. And you're looking at you know desks at the younger grade levels. You typically have tables. 
we're not having tables. We'll be switching desks in and spreading those out and, and things like rug time. We're not gonna be able to get all the kids sitting on the rug. So those things, you know, will get rolled up and stored and, and the larger tables and, you know, those kind of things, the rooms will look different, especially at the elementary level than they have in the back. Um, so, you know, the desk will be spread out, our facilities crew. I know Mr. Thiel's been in conversation, we've all been having conversation with Mr. Markell and the guys and the, and the ladies to, to lay all this, lay all this out. Um, and again, the numbers could be even less or in very different capacities if we have, you know, a thousand kids that do virtual. So is there a way for, like, just say we did the hybrid level and you had 12 children per class and the teacher was using the smart board. Is there a way that the other children at home that are doing virtual that day are able to go into that classroom virtually? That would entail putting cameras in every classroom, which becomes a different kind of issue from an APPR and other standpoint. That's something we can uh, we can approach, but uh, having a having synchronous learning where there's a camera and, and those kind of pieces, but that also goes to an equity issue. If a kid can't log on to a specific time at home because of whatever maybe going on in the household, you know, maybe it's a hot spot. Maybe mom needs a computer because she's working from home or the other siblings are there too. Um, how do you make sure that all students have that same equitable access? So then I guess my question for that would be then how, did the, how does the hybrid work? The hybrid basically, you know, there'd be probably office hour times, there'd be a assigned uh, uh, learning and such like that to occur on the off days and then they can go through those pieces. It's almost like a flipped classroom model. A number of teachers have been using even when we were in a pandemic and a number of them have jumped in even further. Okay. Avery, anything from a student perspective? Has your phone been blowing up for the last hour and a half? Or what? Um, no, I I think that people are asking good questions and that you guys have a lot figured out so far. And these are unprecedented times, so there's a lot of unknowns for sure. Well said. Thank you, Avery. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, and thank you, uh, Avery, for all the everyone for their questions and comments. Um, I got just two pretty simple ones. Um, for the reopening committee, that was, um, you guys opened that up to any stakeholder that was interested, correct? Um, and there wasn't really ever, there wasn't like a cutoff either, correct? Um, you know, anybody that was interested was able to be a part of the committee. Correct. correct. Yeah, we had people joining, you know, even after the first couple of weeks, um, we also, when we first started, we asked if, you know, when we sort of laid out the expectations if people no longer want to be considered. And we did have a few of those as well. So you know, I think we were adding people right along. Yeah. And that's great. I love that you guys, that that was the, our approach to this. Um, and then my other one, um, I think I know the answer to this because we've been talking about costs. Um, you know, we passed, a, the community passed a budget back in June, it was because of the COVID. It was at a different time. But that budget amount, that is like our absolute max that we can spend on the year, correct? Um, the, budget, the budget amount does not change uh, no matter what the circumstances are, so. Right. Um, the biggest you. matter with the budget piece is uh, any revenues that may be decreased because of either sales tax or the, the bigger worry is uh, state aid being decreased from all the do you think there's any chance with the federal money not coming, the state's issues that he's going to remove the tax cap and put it on us locally? I don't see that tax cap ever going anywhere. That's one of his flagships that he's trying to use to control spending in the state. And uh, we can try to override it, but um, I, I, not many districts have been successful doing so. No, I wasn't saying for us to override it. Is he going to remove it and say, take care of yourself, Frontier, with your own taxes? I don't see him doing that okay. because then you, then you get further into the have and have nots for districts. They can't raise funds that way. Yeah, I would agree with that. I know um, I think it's you know one of his biggest uh, political things that he, right when he got into office, uh, you know, he, he used that as a, as a way to make himself, uh, you know, look good to taxpayers that are concerned about um, taxes that were going up um, every year. 
Uh, so before we conclude, are there any more comments, questions from the board? This is a very important topic, obviously. So I definitely want to make sure that there's no stone unturned. Um, hearing none, I do just want to thank uh, Ryan and Jen um, for leading this. Uh, you know, I, it definitely is a massive undertaking. I want to thank the whole committee um, for volunteering their time. And I also want to thank everyone else that sent in their opinions and questions. And um, the board has been getting a lot of emails. I've been trying to respond to them the best I can. Um, you know, do know that we are reading those. Um, but you know, we, we do pass along those to the administration or the committee to kind of get into more of the specifics because that's the appropriate way to do things. Um, but definitely know that we are listening. And um, like Ryan and Jen said, that it really has shaped the plan. Um, and I want to thank staff as well for- We will have an FAQ coming out. Um, a, lot of those, a lot of these questions, we'll, we'll put all these so people can read through. Um, I know that's already in development and you know, We'll put all the questions together, and and people will be able to get that document off our website to you know answer any questions they come. And we'll keep adding to it. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for their flexibility and patience with this whole situation. Um, you know, it's emotional. It it uh, you know affects all of us. And um, but I think you know in the end we're just trying to to get the best solution that we can. And I think the process that we've been going that the committee has been going through really really gets to that. Um, so again, thank you to all. Uh, so with that, um, we, I believe we will now move to item 4.2, which is the discussion of our Board of Education goals for 2020-21. Um, like I said at the beginning of the meeting, um, I did have a, I did have Rich attach the, uh, the goals from last year that he had been uh, kind of annotating. Um, he did highlight it. If I'm correct, um, the spots that are highlighted in gray are ones that he does that he was thinking kind of really fit into the board role versus yellow are more not the board role. Um, and a big part is um, I think in the past the board we didn't quite understand the difference between a district goal and a board goal. A district goal is one that um, is more of a high level bird's eye view. What are we doing as a whole district? Where these board goals are more what do we want to achieve? Um, you know, as a board, the seven of us, and um, you know, whether it's professional development or other type of things that are more personal to us. Uh, and so, with that, I want to make a point that, you know, we're not trying to. We're very aware that uh, reopening school and COVID is extremely important right now. Um, and, but these are just things that, um, you know, as the year goes on, the board wants to work on. Um, you know, in addition to that, uh, you know, and again, these are more for the the board focus. So, um, I guess maybe if Rich. Dr. Hughes, if you would like to um, you know, give some of your thoughts uh, before any other board members do, or if not, we could just jump into it. Uh, you're muted there. There we go. Um, just try to, you know, based on conversations and things that uh, you've all talked about, whether it's as a group or separately, and hearing those kind of pieces, just try to throw a whole bunch of ideas up there uh, based on those things. Um, and, you know, like the first one talks about educational facilities are safe, secure, and will maintain. But for a board goal, what does that mean? Easy one, you know, the one you've had here is arranging tours of the facilities, the view construction product. That's, you know, that's, that's centered around the board. Um, you know, one that could be is, you know, looking at a, a capital project vote, um, exploring that or, you know, creating a 10 year plan. That's why there's question marks after them. Um, just try to throw ideas on based on what I've heard from many of you. And um, that's about it. Uh, so I, I guess I'll jump in then. Um, you know, I kind of have been trying to shape around some of these and maybe uh, organize them in a different way. Uh, you know, and I, maybe the capital project vote, that could be something that is more of a board goal because we're the ones that um, decide whether to put that forward. Um, but I don't know, maybe that is something that could be a district goal because it's you know something that we would want to do for the whole district. Uh, and like, I, you know, I, I, the kind of more broad statements like provide educational facilities that are safe, provide an educational environment. Um, 
you know, I, I guess I see those as more like district level type things. Um, but I agree, you know, visiting the, the buildings is definitely a, a board level type thing. Um, and I sort of seeing it falling into, again, this is just my personal, how I'm seeing things, but goal number five, enhancing, enhancing communication. Um, and, and even number three, like, I think those are kind of all getting to, uh, the board being, um, visible, uh, you know, in the community and, um, also, uh, working, you know, working on professional development and working on ourselves. Um, I know there's been some disagreement over the idea of a board liaison. Um, and like specifically that's, uh, 5B and, you know, I think especially using, um, and I don't mean to pick on Mr. Boyle, I believe he did draft this, but, um, you know, maybe especially the, the idea of being a link to the BOE is where that really is outside of a board role, um, because we don't want to usurp the chain of command. Um, and I guess I sort of feel the same way about being involved in the PTA. I know uh, Laura at the last, at the reorg meeting, uh, I think it was at the reorg meeting that, uh, you know, said, oh, we would love to have board members. Um, obviously we wouldn't want to go for uninvited. Um, and then I guess another thing about it is, um, you know, as community members or a lot, you know, a lot of board members have kids in the district, um, they might already be members of the PTA um, with that. Uh, so that was sort of my thought is, you know, one type of goal would be um, continuing that want to communicate, be more visible um, and strengthen our own, our own selves. Uh, and then uh, another one, um, that kind of is standalone uh, is the ex officio student member. And, um, you know, I'd welcome Avery's thoughts on this. In the past, uh, the board did put together a and finalized a new, more, new board member packet for the elected adult members, um, for lack of a better term. And we started to do that with an ex officio student handbook, but we never finished it. Uh, and so, you know, it, it obviously would make sense for uh, the student representative to be a part of that discussion and drafting that and, you know, really envisioning what is the role of the ex officio student board member, what are the things that they do. Um, so, you know, Avery, I, um, with school and the uncertainty about whether you're going to be going in person, distance, all that, um, I'm sure you're going to have your plate loaded up, but, uh, you know, you being involved, if we were to keep that goal, having you involved with that um, would be one area where I, I personally would be really looking for you to get involved. Um, I guess if I, just before I finish my piece and open it up, um, then the item sevens, item seven, uh, I think we could maybe keep that as one big goal, but I think there's some pieces in there that are some big heavy items that we've really been wanting to attack um, and maybe have, you know, pieces within it. And we, um, you know, for example, committees and wanting to create uh, charters for those committees and really set the structure and um, meeting agendas. And I think that could even fit a little bit in with policy, how we, you know, bring policies because, um, you know, I think we ideally we want to have those discussions in public preliminarily and then um, do some research in between and then um, maybe talk about it more or make a decision on it at that next meeting. Um, but I think that sort of fits into meeting agendas. Um, but really, you know, we can organize these goals any way we want. We can add more goals that aren't a part of this. Um, but I, that's just kind of my thoughts, um, just kind of trying to spell that out. So with that, I'll open it to the floor to hear others' opinions. Davis, it's John. Uh, just two things for the agendas one. One thing I'd like to see that we talk, maybe think about considering is an open topic component to our workshop agendas so that we have an area to speak freely and, and, and maybe begin discussing new ideas or thoughts that we, we might want to consider as a group. So I would think about that under meetings and agendas. Um, the other thing too, with the, you know, some of the new member training and even for ourselves, I'd like to see for us a bit more open meeting law training so that, you know, as we're working towards transparency and doing it right, that, you know, we get more of that up front when, you know, you, you start on the board. 
Um, and then I'm not sure where this fits, but with committees, I don't know how we're going to do it, but I personally would like to see a committee in the personnel committee come back. And if need be, I'd be willing to take the lead on that to establish, you know, a draft concept charter for that and, and, and present it at a future meeting. So I would say with both of those, um, you know, we're trying to set the goals here and I, I did, you know, when we had the agenda meeting, I discussed how, you know, I do want to get into, if we, especially, you know, if, if we have the time to get into um, how do we want to then achieve these goals and what are the next steps? Um, and so I, you know, I, I, I guess I'd want to hear from everyone, um, you know, on that issue and some other ones. Uh, but I do also want to make sure we do really, you know, the first thing we need to do is establish some of these goals. And again, I don't mean to, you know, I think it's very important that uh, we do get to these things. And I think it's, um, I would be open to on the committee example or the committee issue, for example, I'd be open to board members, you know, maybe the chairs of each committee trying to just do a draft um, charter. Um, but, I, you know, I'm open to others' opinions on that as well. Uh, I think that's a good idea, Davis, that the chairpersons of the committees come up with a draft that we can all look at and say, yes, we think this is the way it should flow, or maybe we need to tweak it a bit and also get the input from the superintendent. And so what that would, you know, if, whether it's, um, the personnel committee um, or other committees that board members have the ideas of, would we be open to those board members also trying to draft a charter? I would guess. Um, you know, I guess, again, I just want to make sure that we're doing things the right way. Uh, so, you know, I think that would be, especially if we establish that as a goal, I think that would be um, a good start to really get going on that because, you know, committees are where we do a lot of our, you know, get our hands dirty for lack of a better phrase to really get into the, the work of what we do. Um, so it's important that we, we do get started with those things. So I would be, I would think that would be a good idea. Um, I think we also need to have benchmarks along the way um, right. to say, you know, we've made this much progress what do we need to change? Are things going well? What else uh, do we need to do so that we come very close, if not attaining the goal, but at least coming close to our objectives? Yeah, I really agree with that, um, both on for the goals, but even for the committees as well to, to have benchmarks. Um, that's a great idea. And, I like the idea too of, and I know a lot of the committees do put out minutes, but um, making that that much more formal, I think would be a, a good thing. Um, I will say another part on committees and whether we want to discuss it now or maybe wait till the next meeting, um, but there's, you know, our, our, pol our current policy, I, in my opinion, is a little confusing of the different kinds of committees. Um, there's, a good amount, there's a few committees that only board members and administrators are, are on and they really do um, the main work of the board, for example, budget and finance, uh, the facilities committee. Um, but then there's these other committees uh, that are, you know, have more stakeholders, a part of it, whether it be advocacy committee, which uh, I've chaired since I've been on the board and has kind of been more on the board end, but we welcome anybody and then there's like the safety committee that is a district wide committee, but there are board members that sit on that. Uh, you know, I think it would be good to look into that policy and making it more clear um, those, those specific things. So for example, with the advocacy committee, I guess I am always kind of trying to decide what that committee is supposed to be doing because um, you know, all of our uh, employee groups, um, the PTAs, they all have their, they get advocacy information as well, and they're doing advocacy. So I think like that committee is supposed to sort of connect, you know, try to connect, uh, 
get everyone to collaborate. Right. Um, but, you know, sometimes I'm, you know, lost at exactly, you know, what sh should we be meeting or should it just be emailing? And, um, you know, maybe that's something that, um, you know, I'll think about. I know uh, you all know Mark Gillen very well. He's been very helpful with that committee. And, um, you know, I know he's he's been asking me, um, you know, what are we going to do with that committee and um, all those things. Um, so I definitely think we want to have establishing committees, the roles and charters for each, and having um, minutes be sent as, as a goal. Are there any other parts of that that members can think of? Hey, Davis, I'm, I'm totally in favor of uh, for the committees to have a, a charter or a purpose or at least a high level guideline as to what they do. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to vary just for a couple of minutes. I had, I had sent out a note last night because I wasn't sure how we wanted to approach this. I sent it to uh, Davis and John and Marianne as the leadership team. And what I mentioned was four specific items. And the first one was, um, you know, Dan and I talked a lot about RFPs and said the district has been cited a couple of times because we you know, haven't done a, a, a consistent job at, at putting out RFPs for professional services. And so one of the things I suggested is that we give that as a uh, – assignment this year either to audit or to um, budget and finance to look into, uh, and my thought is something like this, we get a list from Will of all the active contracts for professional services. We look at how long ago they were awarded and if they were bid. We take that list and we say, probably look at that by oldest and most dollars to come back with a plan to work with, that would come back to the BOE and then work with Will and Rich to say, hey, we need to do a better job at RFPs next year. So that's an assignment maybe for audit or finance. That was one. The second thing, we had a little bit of unfinished business from last year on the whole discussion about the sign in the background during the Board of Education meeting, the electioneering issue. And so, you know, I think what we decided after talking about that was that there is, it was not a violation of any policy. We may want to modify one of our policies or have a new policy somewhere to address that. So that's an open issue. So where does that go? We don't have a policy committee is that something that, you know, an individual board member, I'd be willing to do some research to bring back to the board. We want to form an ad hoc on that one. Um, another one was, I really feel personally that you know, there's been a lot of talk about, and John, you've been advocating, Davis, about doing live streaming and recording for the long term. So my opinion at this point, we're going to be doing these virtual meetings for the next three to six months and maybe forever. So we probably should start looking at what our options are to do that. There's some cheap options in the short run that we're experimenting with headsets tonight. Or do we look at the actual boardroom and say, what would it really cost to modify the boardroom? To you know, and I think that's twenty thousand dollars. But we probably need to look into that. Where does that assignment go? Does it go to the district? Rich, do you take it as part of facilities and technology? Should it be a board goal? I'm not sure. And the fourth one was the whole mental health thing. And I've done a little work with um, a gentleman named Mark Robinson to potentially look at some a new mental health collaborative last year. And we didn't get very far because um, right as Mr. Robinson presented a proposal, it was like the first week in March. And that's when COVID hit and every the wheels fell off the train. But the proposal is still out there and maybe it's even more so than now. But where does that go? Should that be a committee thing? Should that just be something between Mr. Robinson and, and Rich and whoever you want to do with it? Or But these were four things that I forwarded to say, what do you want to do with these issues, if anything? And maybe the answer is nothing. So I'm going to stop talking now. Can I jump in there? Uh, why yeah. are we Why are we going to continue meeting virtually? Yeah, I guess I was, um, when you said that, I was thinking myself. I, I know, I believe as of now still, uh, tomorrow, the executive order that was extended that allows us to meet virtually will end. Um, although back in July, when it was, I think it was supposed to expire. Five to 12, yeah. Yeah, right. The the day it was supposed to expire, you know, and we're supposed to have a board meeting that day too, he extended it. Um, so obviously if that gets um, not extended, then we would be required to meet uh in public, board members do have the option under pre-COVID law to meet virtually if they have the 
you know, if they can show their face, um, but also technically you have to advertise where you're going to be as a open meeting place. Um, and unfortunately that's just how the law is. Uh, and, you know, I believe that the, if, unless you know, maybe he could extend it partially and not the whole thing, but if the whole thing is not extended, then we would also have the public would have to be permitted to, to be here. I, you know, I think we would be restricted by social distancing. I think the current one is up to 50. I'm not sure exactly. Um, so we would still be limited by that. Uh, but I think it's possible that it gets extended. Um, although I'm not sure, will it be six months? I'm not sure. Um, so I'm under the understanding we're pushing to have, I mean, it just seems odd that we're pushing to have bring kid, bring these children back in schools and have teachers and faculty there. And yet as a board, we cannot meet in person where we should be. It just, it seems too full to me because well, and I, and I get it, I don't, and don't get me wrong, my children need to go to school, they really do. All children do. Exactly, but I think if we're going to be asking children and teachers to come in to go to work as a board, I think we should make the commitment to try to meet in person to show in good faith that what we're trying to do, right? Well, um, and I, and I would totally preach. I'm sorry, I would totally agree, and I guess, and, and Marianne and Marty, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I apologize up front. But so if, if this thing expires and we're supposed to meet again in person, are you guys going to come into the board meetings? Are, we, are you okay coming back physically? Or are we going to have board members, just like some teachers, ask for accommodations? That's why we would do virtual. Well, if we're going to do social distancing and wear our masks and are six feet apart in the boardroom and the uh, executive order is lifted, I will come in person. Okay. I don't recall the rest of my fellow board members, but I've heard many positive comments about families being able to watch our board meeting from their home. So even if we do go back, I agree, Pat, I do think we need to look at a way, you know, I've seen the numbers have been up to, to give people an option, whether they're small children and they can't come to the board meeting, but would like to be involved or at least see it after the fact. Um, to have that option, especially since so many now have experienced it under this, this COVID scenario. My only concern with that is what is the cost? I mean, we don't know if we're going to get a cut in state aid and we have to preserve program over everything and health and safety. So I think not that I like to do things cheaply, but if we're going to pursue this avenue, I think we have to be very concerned about the cost to the taxpayers of doing this. Yeah, that's a very good point. And on that point, uh, if you notice, I'm wearing earmuffs and, or whatever you call these and the, the microphone and Pat's doing the same. Uh, Linda, you can't see, but she's doing the same. So we're kind of testing that out as possibly a, a cheaper option to where we all would use our Google Meets. Um, but there's other, there's still more things we would have to work out with that. Um, yeah, I know Linda at least mentioned the, you know, if it were being open to the public for privilege of the floor or anybody else speaking, we would have to make sure they have a microphone somehow. Um, but I definitely agree with you that we should try to look for. Um, Not, I don't think, I think we should try to look for it, but if it's a cost of losing a program for these children or the cost of, not bringing another teacher back or replacing a teacher, I would say throw that cost out because, you know, would we have last year, 13 teachers retired and we brought back 8.8? .8. I think it was, correct? I would rather see that cost go back to more faculty and put back into our program. I totally I agree. agree with you. Yeah. And, and my, my point, Dan, really is we don't know what the cost is. So, I'm just saying we probably should look into it and find out what the options are. We may oh, look at the yeah. options and go immediately, hey, the cheapest option is 20 grand. Forget it, right? right. I, I don't know. I just don't right. have the options yet. It might be a, it might be a thousand dollars. You don't know. You're right. Correct. I guess that, yeah. Put yeah. it over a bit. And right. I, I just, at the, uh, at the expense of the children, we need to put more money into programs and more teachers and stuff along with that for these, for these, for the kids' futures. So, Agreed. So, you know, the boardroom can stay the way it is really. Yeah. As a board goal, exploring that as an option and coming up and necessarily not determining what the answer is, but 
finalizing an answer, that's a very measurable board goal um, that I think is definitely worthwhile and it has a timeline to it and it has those pieces. And um, one thing I would suggest is if all members have, you know, some may like the, the ideas just based off of what you've said on there. Some may not, you know, there's other ones you may want to do. I would suggest um, providing those to Davis and that uh, the, the uh, leadership team of the board can then take those um, and try to create a format that can then be shared with all of you to really hone in, um, you know, what the specifics might be and what this, what the schedule could be so that um, it, it's difficult to have seven members mm -hmm. figure all those pieces out at the same time. So if you can highlight the, you know, the four or five things you really want to highlight and any particulars that may help the process uh, go a little more smoothly and have your officers being in charge of combining those uh, pieces into a discussion on item, item for the board to have at the next board meeting. Yeah, and Rich, just specifically on that one, I mean, what I volunteered to do and, you know, like it or hate me, but I said, I would be happy to put together a straw man RFI to say, here's a, here's a request for information. Here's a list of things that I'm thinking that gets floated out to all the board members. They then input to it because it's always easier to start from something than to start from a blank sheet of paper. And then, yeah, then we could, then we could float the RFI and then we, and then we go into exactly what you're talking about. I think that would be a good you know, start if you could do that RFI thing and maybe um, right. send it to me or exactly. send it out to the board. Um, right. I guess maybe we shouldn't do where we're all building on the same document. I'm just, I'm just trying to think about, you know, trying to avoid open meetings law violations, but maybe I'm wrong on that. But at the very least you can look at it and, you know, say, this is what I want to put there. I have an idea for that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, are we saying maybe that it should just be a goal on itself or do we want to include that with, um, you know, going to, to build, going to the buildings, uh, going to district activities, those kind of things. I see them kind of fitting together, um, but I could see also, you know, wanting to really uh, not overwhelm ourselves and really just attack yeah. one, you know, one thing. I, I don't think this is a huge goal. I mean, I think if we just wanted to part of part of that when you just talked about and say, you know, the board will try to put together a. Um, to get together a document that's got the options for for continued live streaming and recording of board meetings. It, it'd be that simple. That could come under the whole communication yes. piece. Right. So that could go yeah, under either. Doing visibility and communication as an overall goal, and here's some benchmarks under there. To investigate the live streaming, attend district activities, you know, those kind of pieces. There's your overarching goal, just as a for instance increase the visibility and communication of the board of, of the board on behalf of, of the board be on behalf of the board or whatever the case would be and then you have some measurements underneath that you can spread out and or have mile markers throughout the year is rfp <laughs> review not an, a natural fit for audit wouldn't that actually be an audit does that even need to be reviewed it, it could it could go either way, John. I just lean, lean toward audit because Dan and I are in both committees, but also I know budget and finance is so busy with the budget from what, December through April or May? Well, I agree with John. Pat, did, uh, doesn't the audit committee come up with things they want to review um, year to year? Like one year, I remember it was Title I. Or, so I think as a group, your audit committee could come up with that. Right. Well, this is this is a little different. What you're referring to, Marianne, is part of our um, our state guidelines. We have to have external audit testing of certain controls. So right. we typically pick one or two areas every year that the external auditors or our internal auditors are also, you know, outside firm does mm -hmm. that. This is more of a just generally speaking, it, it really goes back to Dan's question at the reorganization meeting. You know, we appointed, I don't know, 25 different services, medical services, sports services, banking, lawyer, all those services. And a lot of those services were for our policy says anything over $50,000 will be sent out for RFP. Our policy says that we don't do that. And so this would be more of a, a high level to say, you know, we, we back and look at everything and, and come back to the plan because we also can't do it all in one year. I mean, I think it's, and we'll feel free to chime in here. I think to say to our business department, 
you know, every one of our professional services needs to go out for RFP in the next months. I don't, I don't think we could do that. Will? Well, it's not he. It's not physically possible to accomplish that goal, Pat. I take a little bit of issue with your statement about we don't do that. We have tried to adhere to the fifty thousand dollar limit as established by board policy. So we have not knowingly gone over that limit with any of those awards. So. Yeah, and I and I stand corrected. I mean, it's I don't want people to get the wrong idea. It's not that we don't do it all the time. We don't do it sometimes. And we were we were written up in a state audit. I think it was three years ago, exactly for this item. 2018, I believe it was. I, I guess my question is, is that if there's a way for the district to save money, especially now, looking at trying to bring in the virtual option for children, trying to bring in the hybrid option for children, and for teachers, you have teachers that you're not you're going to try to you, you have to accommodate if they don't want to come back to school because of pre-existing conditions and stuff like that. Anywhere you can save money by putting something out for an RFP, you know, Dr. Hughes brought up earlier, what was it, $200,000 just for K-1 for the barriers, for the plastic barriers, right? Any kind of money is going to help. Uh, then we had the state, what, state aid cut, how much is that going to be? I mean, I think anything that can go for RFP should go for RFP. I, th I don't have a problem with the concept. I have a problem with trying to execute it uh, given our current structure. And I have a problem with uh, the board policy is there for a reason. And if the board chooses to lower the threshold, that's a board decision. But for the last two years, we've been adhering to that board uh, designated threshold. Yeah, that's how, I guess that's how I understood it from the reorg meeting is we follow our policy and we follow the law. It's the pol our policy and our law, we don't always have to go with the lowest bidder necessarily. And part of that is because there's other factors than, you you're know. Dealing with, you're, how can you not go with the lowest bidder? I mean, as long as you're getting a, a comparable bid and it's for apples to apples and not apples to bananas. Well, that's that's what, it, I guess that's where sometimes, I mean, we, and maybe I'm wrong that we don't always go, maybe we well, do always go with the lowest bidder. Yeah, but I guess uh, to me, it's just like, how many programs have we cut from these children? How many teachers have we cut in the last 17 years? To me, lower the threshold so we can all go for a competitive bidding. Or, because I think there's what, two different policies, 5410 and 5411, right, Pat? Yes, there are. So, I mean, you know, we have, right now we have children going to teachers' classrooms after school because they don't want to go home, right? But that program got cut from what I believe, from when I talked to Mary Albert previously. So, I mean, it's just, no, that's where I kind of differ from your, uh, your, your vision there, Davis. I apologize. Well, and Dan, I'll throw something else in too. You know, if we're, when we're, I think the district does a great job when we're procuring goods, because then you can kind of compare widgets to widgets. When you're buying Dunlop tires, it's, it's a commodity with, a, you know, or, Do, or Dell computers or Chromebooks. Professional services are different. And, and Will, I'll give you an example. When's the last time we, we did an RFP on legal services? We have two main firms that do our legal work, right? I mean, BOCES also, but we have two main firms, and I know they're great firms with good lawyers. When's the last time we did an RFP for legal services? And we spend way more than 50 grand a year on those. Well before Will and I were over here. Yep. So, a, I mean, yeah. I agree with you 100%, Pat. I do, because that could be, and I get it, but it's just that could be, we lost 17 teachers last year from retired, you know, we, we lost 17, but we only bat back 8.8. .8. So to me, anything that we could save, we could bring back more faculty. We could bring back another cleaner to help clean for the COVID. We could, yep. we could be adding, it's just, there's a lot of stuff that we need to do. And I think if we, you know, work with it, Pat, I think we could try to make a difference somewhere. Even bring yeah. back some programs too. Yeah, well, and I think that's why we need to look at the whole list and, 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 and we kind of prioritize it by big, big spend first going down because we're not going to, we can't approach them all. I get that, Will. And some of them may look at it and go, there's a reason we, we didn't bid this out, you know, and, and there may be a good reason. I definitely think, uh, Dan, I think your concerns are um, valid for sure. And I, I guess, you know, when I was saying the, we don't always go up to the lowest bidder, and again, maybe we do, but you know, it's that when it's not widgets to widgets, when it's not apples to oranges, when there's a, a clearly better service um, 
for the little bit more you have to pay and maybe it's a lot more that you have to pay. Um, but I don't know. And I, I think it's definitely valid to look into that. And I think that would be an appropriate role of the audit committee. Um, I don't know if we'd want to make that a board goal or just that would end up being an audit committee goal. It seems like an audit committee goal. Whatever you're good with, Pat, I'm good with. And I guess in a way it would fit into the committee goal, developing the charter for the committee would then, and the goals for the year would, would be a part of that goal. Yeah, and certainly if we do it on an audit committee, um, we're, it's gonna, we're gonna be working lockstep with, you know, business with Will and, and Rich on this thing. The goal is to try to save money if we can, but we don't wanna disrupt the operations of the district. That, that's not the intent. And then on the last one, Davis, the electioneering concerns, you know, I do think that needs to be addressed. If we don't have a policy per se, and there was nothing we could do about it, where, where do we put that one into it? Because I don't want elections turning into campaign ads at our board meetings. Again, um, on that one, I mean, first off, I'll say, I think, you know, it wouldn't really be a goal on its own, but maybe a part of, we want to learn how we can, uh, we have the BOCES service that provides a lot of recommendations on policy to us, uh, but there might be things like this that we want to do uh, without their recommendation. And we would, of course, get their advice on it. Uh, but I think maybe we, in that goal, list off some of the policies we want to address, such as uh, meeting agendas as well would be one. Um, but on the specific, if we want to talk about that specific policy, uh, Perhaps the policy isn't absolutely clear about uh, channels of communication versus being physically in a, in a district building. Um, but in terms of what can we do about it, I don't think we could legally have a policy that allows us to do anything other than what we can already do. And that's individually state our opinions about a board member's actions or seeking removal or having the commissioner seek removal, which is extremely, extremely hard to do. And, you know, something like that, I don't think would be uh, not only worth the time, but I don't think we would succeed. Um, and honestly, I, you know, I'd, I'd rather try to, you know, work with people and try to, to try to be as positive as possible. Um, but I, you know, I, if you guys have those concerns, I would say adding that as a, a policy we want to look into would make sense. Um, I don't know if we want to, between now and next board meeting, have board members do any kind of research into other policies like that out there, um, reach out to NISBA or, or, or if we want to send this to Bo the BOCES service and have their opinion first. What um, did the attorney say about the electioneering process when that happened with the sign? Um, I, I maybe could pull it up, but it was pretty plain that uh, you can't use channels of communication and so the board members shouldn't do that. Um, I think he was cautious to say, you know, I can't speak for Mr. Friedman, um, and maybe this is inappropriate to say, but um, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, well, yeah, David, you had, you had it right, David. I mean, what the attorney basically said, it's clear in New York State Ed Law that says, you know, if you're using any district-funded communication channel, you can't do any electioneering. However, it, there is that fine line. You know, Mr. Lalka said he was sitting in his home he was on his internet connection, but he was in a frontier Google Meets. So it's kind of like, it was that gray area. So the lawyer said, no, you don't want to do that. It's probably not right. But he didn't say, you know, for sure. So this is right. you know, a gray line. See, that all goes back to we're in a new frontier, so to speak, with live streaming and communicating via the internet. So it's a whole new area to explore. Right, and the only thing I'd say, Marianne, is that you know it is a big area, but like like um, Dan said earlier, if we're going to eat an elephant, if we want to if we want to start to look at the whole thing and say we're going to look at you know media and communications and all the channels and you know are we using are we using Twitter properly and texting and emails and virtual and all the stuff which we could do, that's a big that's a big job and it'll probably take us a long time to have a product come out. But no, I, I understand hear, that. Yeah, yeah, I hear I what you're saying. Think I agree, we have to do it piece by piece, but it is a new place to start exploring. We don't have any current policies that address these specific 
kinds of things that are virtual. You are correct. Yes. Yeah, I agree with Marianne there too. And Pat, I think going forward, I think we need to look at like our social media policies and our virtual meeting policies as well. Uh, while I'm not too familiar with what happened with the sign in this electioneering thing to me, but it, it would sound like there's probably a million other places where someone could have sat where you didn't see a sign. You know, so I don't know. Um, so I think perhaps uh, there's a few different, you know, maybe the it's not specific to the electioneering policy, but policies regarding technology and social media. Uh, looking at, you know, I, it'd probably be hard to look at every single policy we have and see if that general idea would apply to it and if we want to change it. Um, but maybe board members, you know, can try to brainstorm ones that, you know, in addition to this electioneering one um, and a social media one, other ones that we would want to do, uh, you know, policies we want to really attack uh, in, the, in the upcoming year. Um, so maybe maybe we make that a goal, you know, policies we want to review, uh, and I have those two. The well, I guess it's one the social you know, social media and technology generally, uh, but if there are, uh, oh yeah, and I, I did say I think the meeting agendas relooking at that policy would make sense under the policy goal. Um, well, yeah, Davis, along those lines, Marty, you've mentioned several times about. You know what? Why are we doing business at, at workshops? We have a, we have a, one of our policies has the uh, work has the agenda meeting. We don't have a we don't have one for the workshops. Maybe we should yeah. have one for the workshops. Um, my personal opinion on that, if I could jump in, I I've thought about this a good bit recently, and I I just feel pretty strongly that, um, you know, again, there's no policy on work sessions. There's nothing in the law about work sessions. Every meeting we have is technically a biz public business meeting. You know, so um, go ahead, David. Um, um, you know, I just think that it might make sense to have every meeting be a, a business meeting, but we have a work session portion. And that goes to what Mr. Kilcoin was saying about having a, a, a time where um, we can just bring up new ideas freely just to really just very preliminary, get that idea started. And then the next board meeting, maybe we really dig into it. And then the next meeting after that, we actually vote on it. Um, you know, because really we always have business items on work session days because it's, you know, we're a, we're a school bit or we're a school district that's constantly doing things and we, we can't wait the two weeks because we might um, lose out on an employee or a service or something like that. Uh, and then on the, the business meeting side of things, a lot of times we have discussion items. Um, so that's just, you know, my thought. The only difference is we don't have privilege of the floor in the round table at work sessions versus we do at the business meeting. Yeah. Um, and personally, I wouldn't be opposed to having that opportunity at every meeting. Um, but so, so that's just my idea on that, on that specific policy, but I guess back to the broader, Oh, Mr. Law, I'm yeah, sorry. Um, at the workshop, uh, a presentation or two, that's what I was always telling Pat and, uh, Mr. Albert came up with a great idea put a uh, point of pride on the workshop. Don't put it on a business. Yeah, well, I think especially if we were to keep them separate, maybe balancing them out a little bit more and being a little more consistent with what's on one day and what's on the another is, if we were to keep with that, I would definitely push for, for that as well on that point. So maybe, um, you know, with the workshop and points of pride, especially if you have uh, first grader, second grader, you get them up there and you can get them out right away. They don't have to yeah. sit around at a business. Yeah, I agree with that. If we made everything a business meeting and we had an open session, we could ultimately accomplish the same thing and then do either topic at either meeting as needed, correct? Right. What about working on like policies and stuff like that? I mean, at our retreat, Andrew said that we should be trying to keep our workshops to a minimum of two hours. Yeah, and I am looking at the clock. We're about at that right now. Well, uh, I have no problem. I'll sit here till 11 o'clock tonight and hammer things out. But I'm just thinking that like, if you make every workshop a business meeting as well, 
will we be able to meet our goals? I, I get what you're saying, but at the same time, I mean, if we're, we have to do this much stuff in a month's period, whether we put all the discussion and presentations on one meeting and then business items on another meeting, or if we mix them in, I think in the whole, that whole course of a month, we still get the same amount of things done, if that makes sense. Um, kind of lost me, but it's okay. <laughs> I guess I'm just, I'm thinking that, you know, I get what you're saying that we want to keep things to two hours, but I don't think having no, it's not even the two hour mark. I'm just thinking like, you know, by the time we do a workshop like today, we got on, we had our executive session, right? And then now we're into a workshop. And you know, if we have privilege of the floor at every meeting, I think it's gonna be very tough for us to get anything you get the policies done and get business done and do the work we're supposed to do. Yeah. That's my only concern. Well, I would love to hear from everybody though. I enjoyed reading all the emails. Yeah, yeah uh, that's a good point on the privilege of the floor. And perhaps we um, we could still limit it to once a month or something along those lines. It's not none of it is required by law. Uh, or if there's a, if there's room on the agenda, you can add it. That's my thinking because I just want to make sure we get done what we're supposed to get done. Yeah, and I think how we order the agenda is a, a, a part of that. So maybe having work session at the end versus at the beginning, like we did today would allow us to we put the things that we really want to accomplish at the top and then maybe there's some other items that if we have time for we talk about it or if not we move it to the next meeting richard um, McMahon, what are your thoughts i'm sorry were you asking me yeah oh, well, seeing what yours and rich thoughts were on that i think davis's last comment about swapping the ends of it is the business pieces especially on a workshop we don't put things on a business agenda unless it's mostly consent um, or any like heavy discussion items that will, you know, never happen. You know, you know it, I can't remember a time it has. Um, so, you know, that's an easy switch and, uh, you know, doing the schedule with different or our leadership agenda setting meetings and making sure you guys have the agendas by Thursday and all the documents to go with them. Those are the pieces we can also do, but then also determining what are the topics you all want to discuss throughout the year, goals wise, and we can take all those pieces and plot specific board meetings. Um, I think you all have a copy of a schedule that uh, Linda sent you that show the board meeting the board meeting schedule, and what we can do is put specific topics on specific dates. Yeah, just to clarify on that, I believe Linda did send it to the board leadership team, myself, Nello okay. and Mr. Kilcoin, but didn't send it to the rest of the board. You know, if you if you both would be comfortable with doing that, I'm, I'm sure the rest of the board would appreciate it. But it was basically an Excel file or a Google Sheets of all of the meetings throughout the year and trying to like pinpoint topics for them. You know, just like with the agendas, it's flexible, uh, but a general idea of what we're looking at really helps us out because you know I think we all want to accomplish these things but we end up getting to the end of the year and um, some some things didn't happen and so I think that'll allow us to really pinpoint where we want to do those things um, hey Davis one thing yeah. we could do too with the open topics section is limited I mean set a time frame again the purpose there is to get our idea into the public and in the open to, to move it forward. It doesn't have to be a big, you know, time. It's just, that's the window to get new ideas out, get them addressed in some way and, and move on. That's a good point, John. Yeah, agreed. And I, you know, I think having it at the end of the meeting will really allow for that. And I think having that open discussion, you can bring new items up. You don't have to tell the president how many days ahead of time will help us get those ideas out the right way and then be able to work from there. Um, I'm not trying, you know, I'm definitely, if the rest of the board and everybody wants to keep going on this, I'm more than welcome to do that. But I also am, do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, and I think we're kind of getting an idea. Um, I can take this and put it into a draft. Uh, and I, I guess I'll send it out to everyone. But again, it'd be good for you to, if you have comments to just reply back to just me, not the whole board. Um, and then, I think at the next meeting, um, we can put it on the agenda to officially approve these. 
Uh, but like we said, there's some things that we can sort of get started on, like the committee charters. Um, and so I will say we one goal that we want is the policy re review and specific policies we want to look at. Uh, another one, I guess maybe committees could be a part of that, but I think committees are such a big thing that having it as its own goal would be good. Um, and then that communication visibility piece that we talked about earlier. And so then the only other one, uh, yeah, because the RFP thing, we'll have that as an audit committee uh, piece. Um, the mental health piece, I guess I'll get just briefly on that. Um, you know, I think that is more of a district level goal. Um, I think it's a good district level goal, uh, but, um, you know, I would defer to Dr. Hughes and uh, Mrs. Duggan, uh, Dugan, uh, on that. And, um, you know, I, I get, again, I would suggest that as a, a district goal, but only, you know, as my role as a board member and how I play into uh, district goals. And, you know, again, I'm not sure where those, I'm not exactly sure where that starts. You recommend those district goals to us and we just approve them or, uh, but, you know, I think mental health is a big thing on everyone's mind. Well, I, I think you're going to be pleasantly, uh, so maybe not surprised, but the strategic plan that is coming forth has that as one of its main intents. So it is included in there. So the board, I mean, the board can tweak the, the uh, strategic plan and set those goals based off that. But um, it's 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 in there. It's Prego. It's in there. A Regu. I'm not sure which one is it. It's a Prego or Regu. <laughs> It's right. There. And I do, I, I remember now that you were saying strategic planning has really, the strategic planning committee has really been um, working on district level goals and the mission and the vision. Um, so I really do look forward to that. Um, and I'm happy to hear the mental health piece will be a part of that. Um, so then finally, just on the ex officio student um, orientation program handbook, um, Avery, would you be willing to help us? You know, probably at least in the short term, we'd be meeting virtually like this. Um, and we can share you what we sort of started already. Um, and then maybe, you know, right now this only says published by January 2020, so it'd be 2021. Um, but maybe we have another goal of trying to get an outline first of what we want and then um, and then work on publishing it. Uh, yeah, that's definitely something I'd like to take part in. Great. I'm sorry, what was that? Right. I don't, and I don't, we do have um, a draft that we did start working on. And I guess with, with the outline thing, I guess, you know, just making sure that there's nothing not in that draft that we started with, uh, making sure we hit all the points. But, um, you know, I appreciate your willingness to do that. Um, and I'll make sure that you, know, you get the information on that um, when we go forward with that. So I think that would be another good board goal. Um, are there any other ideas on board specific goals? Uh, hearing none, again, thank you everyone for their contributions both to the reopening conversation and to this conversation. Um, I thought this was really productive and it was great um, how everyone contributed. So then with that, we are going to move to the business portion of the meeting. And we're going to start with 5.1, which is an appointment, FCTA number one. Resolved on the recommendation of the superintendent, the following individuals are appointed to teaching positions, salaries in accordance with the current district FCTA contract. All recommended appointments have fingerprint clearance from the New York State Education Department, Office of School Personnel Review and Accountability. Except to the extent required by the applicable provisions of the Education Law Sections 2509, 2573, 3212, and 3014, in order to be granted tenure, the classroom teacher shall have received composite or overall annual professional performance review ratings pursuant to Education Law Sections 3012C and or 3012D. First, we have Marissa Mergler will be a regular substitute at Frontier Middle School, appointment effective 805-20 to 630-21. Next is Michelle Lake, who will be a probationary guidance counselor throughout the district, effective date 8520 to 8424. May I have a motion? So moved. 
Moved by Mr. Lalka. Second. Second. Second by Dr. Costello. Anybody on the question? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, uh, that passes seven to zero. Congratulations, Marissa and Michelle. I apologize, during normal times, we uh, have the new employees come and we give them a pin. Um, I apologize, but you're well, really welcome to the district just the same. So then we move along. A little, oh, did we, did we do the consent agenda? I might have skipped that. I apologize. Or we could read all of them, but it would probably. Um, I apologize for that, everyone. Uh, just hang in tight there. Would I just list off the? Yeah. Yeah. Resolve that the Board of Education approves all the items listed under the under consent. Is that? Sufficient? So moved. Moved by Mr. Kilcoin. Second. Seconded by Mr. Lalka. On the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes 7-0. <laughs> Dave, it's just one note. My iPad from the school is not charging. I'm at 1%. If I lose you, I'll try to dial in. Okay. Thank you for the warning. So now we get to move to 5.6, which are the second round of appointments uh, for the FCTA. Resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the following individuals are appointed to teaching positions, salaries in accordance with the current district FCTA contract. All recommended appointments have fingerprinting clearance from the New York State Education Department Office of School Personnel Review and Accountability, except to the extent required by the applicable provisions of the education law sections 2509, 2573, 3212, and 3014 in order to be granted tenure. The classroom teacher shall have received composite or overall annual professional performance review ratings pursuant to education law sections 3012D and or 3012D. First, Elena Nakiuba will be a probationary grade five teacher at Blaisdell, effective dates 805-20 to 804-2024. Next, Mark Smaldino, uh, and a probationary appointment as a grade five teacher at Pinehurst, effective dates 805-20 to 806-23. Uh, Mr. Smaldino previously served as a regular substitute here. Next, Grace McMahon will be a grade two teacher at Blaisdell. I, excuse me, as a regular substitute. And the effective date is 805-20 to 129-21. May I have a motion? So moved. Seconded. Uh, moved by Mr. Kilcoin, second by Mr. Diplock. On the question. I just wanted to jump in and say I had the uh, pleasure of sitting with our elementary principals, uh, Mrs. Dugan and uh, Mrs. Pinker yesterday, um, going through the final interviews uh, for, for our elementary staff. And uh, we are getting three wonderful individuals and stuff to our classroom. I know at least one of them is a former Falcon, so that's always cool too. Any other on the questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passed 7-0. Congratulations also to Elena, Mark, and Grace. All right, 6.1, position and job control behavioral specialist. Resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent the Board of Education creates one FTE behavioral specialist effective 805-2020. May I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Mr. Lalka. May I have a second? Second. 
Second. Second by Mrs. Arrington, thank you. On the question. Where will this behavioral specialist be housed? This will be split between Blaisdell and the middle school. It'll be under Title I funding. Thank you. Any other is comments it, or questions? Sorry. I have a question. So is this, we're, we're just adding one more behavioral specialist to the district for just those two? Correct. There's, there's, there was a request during the budget process to do so um, because some of the high needs uh, that we have, especially those two buildings for some, we debated with the social worker, behavioral specialist, uh, guidance, guidance counselor, um, and the administrators thought a behavior specialist was the, the best way to go, and that'll come out of our Title I funding. Okay, that was already budgeted for, obviously, right? Yes. Cool. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes 7-0. So now 6.2, retirement, FCEA, W. Benson. Resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the Board of Education accepts the resignation for retirement of Wendy L. Wendy L. Benson, senior clerk typist, FAC slash pupil, pupil services, effective 10-17-20. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Thank Motion by Mr. Boyle, second by Dr. Costello. On the question, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes 7 0. Best wishes on your retirement, Wendy. Another retirement, 6.3, FCEA R. Car Carson. Resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the Board of Education accepts the resignation for retirement of Roberta Carson Cleaner, Cloverbank, effective 725-20. May I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Mr. Lalka. Second. Second by Dr. Costello. On the question? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes 7-0. Best wishes on your retirement, Roberta. 6.4, retirement, FCEA C check. Resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the Board of Education accepts the res resignation for retirement of Cheryl Check, senior clerk typist, Blaisdell, effective 10-17-20. May I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Dr. Costello. Second. Uh, second by Mrs. Harrington on the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, passes 7-0. Congratulations on your retirement, Cheryl. Best wishes. 6.5 retirement, FCEA L. Flown. Resolved upon the recommendation of superintendent Board of Education accepts the resignation for retirement of Linda Falone, cleaner, Blaisdell, effective 10-24-20. May I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Mr. Walka, second by Dr. Costello, thank you. On the question, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, that passes 7-0. Best wishes on your retirement, Linda. 6.6 .6, retirement, FCEA M. Sherman. Resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the Board of Education accepts the resignation for retirement of Mary Sherman, clerk typist, fax slash instruction office, effective 10 17 20. May I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Dr. Costello. Second. Second by Mr. Walka. Thank you. On the question? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, that passes 7-0. Best wishes to you, Mary. 6.7, retirement, FCEA slash S. Wildman. 
Resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the Board of Education accepts the resignation for retirement of Susan Wildman, food service helper, Blaisdell, effective 9-1-20. May I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Do you have a second? Aye. Second. Thank you, Mr. Diplock. On the second, all in, uh, on the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, that passes 7-0. And now we'll move a little further along because we voted on these on the consent agenda. And so now we're moving to 6.11, appointment FCRNA, Deborah D. Resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the Board of Education appoints the following individual to support staff position, salary in accordance with current district FCRNA, collective bargaining agreement and salary schedules. Further, this recommended appointment is pending upon fingerprint clearance from the New York State Education Department slash Office of School Review and Accountability. Uh, we're appointing Deborah D as a registered nurse for the district in a full position, effective date 08-19-20. May I have a motion? So moved. Moved second. by Mr. Walter, second by Mrs. Arrington, thank you. On the question, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? <laughs> Hearing none, passes 7-0. So we move to 7.1, adoption of the district safety plan. Resolved that the Board of Education adopts the 2020-21 District Safety Plan as presented at the hearing. So moved. Moved by Dr. Costello. May I have a second? Second. Second. Uh, wow. Second by Mrs. Arrington on the question. Uh, just thank you to everyone that contributed to putting that together. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, passes 7-0. 7.2, adoption of building level safety emergency response plan. Resolved that the Board of Education adopts the confidential building level emergency response plan as required by the State Education Department. Um, May I have a motion? Thank you, Dr. Costello. May I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Walton. Thank you. On the question. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, that passes 7-0. 7.3, real property tax levy. Resolved that the 2020-21 Frontier Central Board of Education does hereby certify that $42,374,013 is the amount of the net budget for the said school district for the year which is to be raised by a tax against the real property located in such school district liable for the such school district taxes and do certify that based on the tax school violation valuation as certified by the assessors of the towns of Hamburg and Eden, the tax rate to raise such amount will be calculated by the superintendent or his designee using a tax levy of $42,374,013, the certified taxable valuation and the final equalization rate as provided by the New York State Board of Equalization and Assessment. And do direct that the amount of such budget be levied and raised and that pursuant to section 1318 of the real property tax law, the amount for $2,448,488 are unexpended surplus funds that have been applied in determining the amount of the surplus levy. May I have a motion? So moved. So moved. Uh, moved by, was that Mr. Kilcoin? Yeah. And who was on the second? I think Pat Boyle. I'll, I'll second. Boyle. Thank you. Uh, on the question? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, passes seven to zero. And our last item of the day. 
7.4 2020-21 revenue, bud revenue budget. Resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the Board of Education approves the revenue budget for the 2020-21 school year, excuse me, as outlined below with additional details included in the backup information provided to the Board of Education. Real property tax will be $42,374,013. State aid and federal aid is $36,710,916. Erie County sales tax, $5,460,000. Miscellaneous revenue of $2,493,174. An appropriated fund balance slash reserve of $2,448,000. And four hundred eighty-eight dollars for a total of eighty-nine million four hundred eighty-six five ninety-one. May I have a motion? So moved. So moved. moved by Dr. Costello and second by Mr. Kilcoin, I believe. Yeah. On the question, I'll just say so. This is what I was talking about in the reopening discussion. That's kind of our maximum, um, but I think we are worried about. Uh, you know, the state aid, federal aid piece. That was actually my question from the question. I mean, so if we approve this now and there's cuts to our aid, what would happen to our budget? We have, well, we have, built, we have surplus built into our budget in various categories. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I don't know, there's a, seems to be an echo. We have surpluses built into our budget in various categories. We're holding money back in reserve and not spending except on essential items at this point. Uh, we will hold off as long as we can to try to keep as much money in reserve. Uh, if we hear from the governor in the first few months of the year, obviously we'll cut back in certain categories and uh, we will hold the line as tightly as we can on all expenditures until we have some certainty in revenue, which might not be until well into the next calendar year. So we're we're not buying anything more than what is necessary at this point. So Will, another way to say, I think what you said is our max spend, no matter what is this 89 and a half million dollars. If our revenue numbers come in short, we can still spend the money, but it's a zero sum game. So we'd have to take it out of reserves or we don't spend. Correct. What happens if we get a big bill for this COVID for PPPE? Can't, ex can't exceed 89.5 million, right? We'd have to not spend something else. Correct. We have already started accumulating uh, PPE. We did that last budget year with uh, funds in the last couple of months of the year. And we continued throughout the summer to build the supply of PPE because it's now somewhat available and supplies right. can be delivered. But we are definitely concerned about prices going forward and we're concerned about deliverability. But to my knowledge, where we have 27,000 masks? We just received 20,000 masks in the building uh, the other day. Uh, we have, I think almost 30,000 total in district at this point. Um, it's, uh, it's a little difficult to estimate what we need going forward because we don't know the model we'll be teaching under and we don't know the duration that we'll be teaching under that model. So purchases like the screens, as was mentioned earlier, purchases of different kinds of room, air movement, equipment, and uh, all those kinds of purchases all have hefty price tag. And we're trying to balance what we think the likely result of the education program is with the uh, need to accumulate people now. So my question is, is that if we spend all this money for all this stuff and the governor decides to say we're totally virtual, what happens to the millions of dollars or the half a million dollars that our district has spent? The money spent. Well, I mean, John, so okay. 30,000 masks and if we have, what would that get us? Like what, a five weeks of school if every kid needed a, a mask? Well, we, if you had to give every kid a mask every day, it would be a very, it would be a shorter time frame. 
Right. Um, the the expectation is that won't be the case based on attendance and people have accumulated their own masks over time. Um, so we we've, we've tried to anticipate a need to get us started, but if we go back to school, we will have to continue these purchases. So it's really kind of a estimation game right now is trying to figure out where we are in the process, what the likely result is and what the need is. And will there be an, an available supply when we determine that we're ready to roll forward with additional purchases? Yeah, and Dan, your point is well taken because if we don't order the stuff, we won't have it if we need it. But if they go all virtual, we won't need it. And then we're holding it all. So exactly. this is a... This is a nasty cycle we're in, and I know Will, you're trying to do everything you can. This is this is difficult. No, and I, I mean, and I'm not I'm not trying to be hard on anybody. I, I, it's just no matter what we pick, only one third of everyone's going to be happy, and the two thirds of everybody else is going to be very upset with us. And I get that totally. My whole thing is is that I hate to see the district spend half a million or eight hundred thousand or even a million like some other districts have, and then for the governor just to say, okay, well now you're totally virtual. So now you have all this equipment and everything you just spent as the district and it's just sitting there collecting dust when it's not getting used. But then I also don't want to see where we don't have, every kid doesn't have a mask. And I, you know, it's just, it's the whole scenario just sucks. Totally. Yeah. That's a good word for it. And, it's um, just, you know, I think it, it goes to, and the reopening conversation about, you know, why we're frontier at least isn't trying to get too ahead of things and trying to make too many plans that, uh, where we end up having to spend a lot of money that we don't end up using. Um, but at the same time, you have to, we have to be prepared. And I know a lot of people um, are concerned about wanting to be making sure that they are prepared for the start of school. And um, so it really is a hard balance. And I, I agree, it sucks. I'm sorry, did you have something more to say, Dan? No, so I mean, basically, so this $89 million for this proposed budget and for everything right now. So basically, if we could, we could open it with virtual with that, and we could do hybrid with that, and you guys would be good. We 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 built enough flexibility in the system to operate either model, and the real key is not what the top line spending number is, but what the state aid and Erie County sales tax numbers are in reality versus budget. Any other comments or questions from the board? Uh, it was a good discussion, good questions for sure. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, that passes 7-0. And we move to, uh, it's 8.1 adjournment. Resolved that the Board of Education adjourns from its workshop meeting. May I have a motion? Aye. Uh, moved by Mr. Diplock and seconded by Mr. Lalka. On the question, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, uh, that passes 7 0. We do conclude our workshop meeting. Thank you, uh, everyone, for attending and for everyone that watched at home. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Have a good night. Thanks. Good night. Good night.